Alrighty, everyone, we are now ready. How is everyone doing? I know that was a bit quick, but we are pretty much ready to go. Um, <clears throat> so without further ado, I'm actually going to just get us started with our guests. On screen, you should see a couple of people. And now they should all be able to hear me. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to the third episode of the Producers Roundtable podcast. I realize my webcam's all the way down here, not up here, so I keep looking at the wrong one. Um, so why don't we just start off by going around and introducing everyone. Um, let's start with DMTR, Mr. Blurry, over here, and we'll go around. Awesome, awesome. Oh, can't hear me. Oh, hold on, y'all. They can't hear. I'm so sorry. I just realized <laughs> this is already scuffed. I just realized they couldn't hear you at all. So, Feels bad. so I'm so sorry. It's, DMTR, you want to hey, do that one yeah, more time? Polished. Can already off to now? a good start. Anyways, I'm so sorry, DMTR. Yeah, they can. They should be able to hear you now. All right. Um, so, yeah, uh, my name is DMTR. My real name is Dimitri, hence my uh, artist name. Um, like I said, I'm just a regular guy making music, um, learning from other people, hanging out in Twitch chats, um, not really doing anything special, but trying to find my own sound. Yeah, uh, well, I'm somebody's... assuming that sound includes uh, white noise and, and distortion. White noise, distortion, and a lot of sign uh, <laughs> basis. Nice. All righty. Alchemy. Hi, everyone. My name is Ian. Um, I go by Alchemy on Twitch and SoundCloud and whatever. I'm kind of just in the same boat as all of you of enjoying music production and getting close with the community and kind of learning from everybody on a day to day basis. Also, like DMCR is being super humble. Um, he's doing really big things. You really should go check him out. Just just saying. Exactly. <laughs> Alrighty, and then finally, last but definitely not least, this one down here. All right, uh, my name's Jaren. I go by Funk Mod, a resident Twitch chat shit poster. Um, I also um, dubstep DJ slash producer. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for doing this with me. Uh, I know we are in a bit of a weird spot. Right now, with all the coronavirus stuff going on, uh, I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy and stuff. Well, you got to stay inside, so as a producer, that's maybe a good thing. <laughs> it's just another Monday. Pretty much. Basically. It's. I mean, definitely there are some things to be considerate of, but I actually appreciate how much, how busy Twitch has been. I think that we've seen a lot of new faces and I think that it's actually encouraged a lot of people to come in and actually maybe like start producing music and being like, you know what, maybe it's finally time because I got nothing else to do. 100%. I mean, the Twitch music community has honestly exploded. Like, I'm going to hide everyone's uh, face for a second because I want to actually show off just like how the Twitch music category is doing right now. Like we're we used to be like down here in like the five to six k viewer range we regularly hit 20 30 50 60 thousand viewers in the music category like we have armin van buren streaming right now couch fam is still streaming um i saw you know um <clears throat> who was it that was streaming oh where'd funk mod go um, I come back and funk mod. Like secret memes. Secret okay, memes. secret memes. Secret memes for funk mod. Anyways, um, uh, you know, Mr. Kenny Bill Beats is on. streaming. Yeah, Mr. Bill, Matt Zoe, uh, Laxity is streaming a lot more again. There's like so many people streaming now. Shades. Um, Carissa. Oh my gosh, who else? Um, who else was streaming Trump. yesterday? Abstract was streaming. Yep. Like, man, everybody. Like, so it's a, it's, I think it's a really exciting time to be a Twitch music producer, I feel like. Uh, and I'm I'm kind of curious, I guess just to start with that, how do you feel about the influx of new uh, producers streaming? Like, I think we all can kind of accept that it's generally a good thing, but like, 
what do we feel about it? Do we think that they're um, kind of encroaching on our space, or do we think that they're people who will be part of our community? Like, what do what do we what do we feel? Whoever wants to go, open open t- table. I'll go for a spicy take. Okay. So it is great that like there's an influx of uh, an audience, but at the same time, I feel like having people that are just starting streaming and being inexperienced aren't giving like the full experience of somebody that has a little bit um, more time streaming because they're sitting there like troubleshooting and all this stuff. And they're like, and then people might get the wrong impression that it's just like, it's like not very professional, I suppose. But that's just my take on it. But it is great that there's more people coming in. It's just um, I I kind of am skeptical of what their first experience might be like. I think it's a fair point. Does anyone else uh, mm-hmm. agree or disagree? What do we think? I, I was talking to DMTR before actually all of us got together. And one thing I was mentioning is that like as a Twitch streamer, regardless of what you're producing, you are usually doing one of two things. You're either being um, informative or educating or you're entertaining. And so to that extent, you know, at the end of the day, like none of us really have hearsay about who decides to stream or who does what because it's all open. Um, that being said, I think that it's kind of clear on who, especially within our circle, because there's a lot of other like Twitch streamers and stuff that are into doing their own thing. But I think that we've all kind of developed like a little bit of mindfulness about like not only being well with rating other people and supporting the community and doing that. And I think anybody who's on board with that, like, you know, who cares? Because even even as a Twitch streamer or whatever, I might be doing something that, you know, your viewers might not like or vice versa. So I think that the more that we can expose people to that and give them their own choice and let them fulfill that, I think would be better for the community overall. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? I saw. I know you said you agreed with Funk Mod uh, DM Charlie. Did you have anything else? Um, yeah, just a minuscule thing that like popped into my head uh, as soon as you said that, and I've been like trying to catch up with all these streams from Shades and Eprom and stuff. Um, but I never see like those big channels actually rate or host other channels, which is sure. like a small thing that seems so easy to do, but none of them do it. And like the viewers are there for like an hour or two and then they're gone back to their normal lives. And it's like, it doesn't stay on Twitch. Mm-hmm. You want to say something with me? Yeah, I was going to ask. Um... And, and kind of regards to all this stuff, I because um, you've been here a while. Whittler has been here a long time. I don't know if, when when exactly you started, but I know that you guys have been around. And uh, DMCR and I are relatively new. Funk Mod, I, I'm not actually sure. Like, do you do you stream? Yeah, yeah. Um, when he does, it's awesome. <laughs> when he does, it's awesome. Okay, I just wanted to like not make it seem like you're not being included or, or anything. Um, oh but, no, it's or, fine. I wouldn't really consider myself a streamer. Okay, so it's all good. I guess for us like newer ish streamers and stuff, like, do you feel like there's like this uh, tier list or so of people that are interactive with each other or of what part of the community? Because maybe those people that are doing those things, like the bigger streamers aren't rating us because they're not really concerned about that. They have their own circle, you know, or, um, or maybe their own prerogative, I guess. I think I honestly, um, I think that that's a really good point. Um, I think a lot of these newer producers don't, and by newer producers, I mean like the the big names coming on to Twitch. Be specific um, about that. Um, and what uh, what I'm Doggo said in chat is actually another big point. Um, like they don't know Twitch, they don't mm-hmm. understand Twitch culture, they don't yeah. understand the kind of community that we've built, and <clears throat> like the the sort of almost family I would say that we've started to develop here. Um, and for them, like they look at Twitch as, oh, that's the gaming platform. That's the place where people play video games. And they actually kind of forget that, you know, the biggest category consistently is not a video game. It's just chatting. The biggest category on this platform yeah. easily is just chatting. Like unless there's a tournament going on or there's a fresh new game coming out. Like you have like Soda Poppin, you have XQC, you have uh, Hasanabi, you have Trainwrecks, you have all these people who they play games, but really they're just chatting streamers. Like Jake and Bake uh, is a whole thing, IRL streams. It's just a completely different world. Um, mm-hmm. 
but people don't seem to recognize that. And so you end up with people who are like, oh, well, I'm just going to you know, download OBS and I'm going to start streaming. And that's how most of us get started, frankly. That's how most of us end up doing uh, Twitch. But since they have an audience, they end up getting 50, 60, 80, 100, 200, 3,000 views. <laughs> and uh, a lot of times, like you're saying, like they're spending a lot of, or what, what uh, Funk Mob was saying, they're spending a lot of their time basically troubleshooting for their first streams. And people come in and it's like, it's kind of janky. Why would I watch this when I could just watch someone play, you know, League of Legends? Sounds the same. Mm -hmm. It's something that's interesting that I'm sure all of us have thought about is the actual like role and fulfillment that we have to do as far as like streaming music. Um, you and uh, and Whittler and everybody else who does producer challenges, I think, have have done a really good job. But the thing is, like when you're playing games, there's always something going on. I think that it takes like a very special kind of person to tune into somebody producing a song, listening to the same loop over and over again. And not only that, but you can't make the choices. And not only that, but you like you have no say in the project that you're watching. You can interact and you know make suggestions and stuff. But you know, I I wonder if there's something that is more accessible to you know to bring more people onto that kind of platform. Mm -hmm. And the challenges, in a, in a way, are an excellent kind of like sidetrack to that because it brings people in. Oh no, absolutely. And then kind of that's one of my kind of goals. It's the reason why I have this podcast, the reason why I have Theory Thursday, the reason why I have all these things, like the music tutorial reaction streams that I do sometimes. Like, it's shit posty content. Like, it's total shit posty content. But yeah. it's something where the mm -hmm. audience can engage themselves. And I think that, like, for smaller streamers, oops, like yourself, uh, for people who are still getting started, like, the tier list that you were talking about, I don't think it's so much about the streamer as it is about the content of the stream. Right. Because, like, I think that, honestly, I'm not a good producer. I think I'm decent, but if I'm trying to be honest about my skills, I'm not the best. But you know what I do have? I have a personality. I have a good head on my shoulders for explaining concepts. And I think I'm decent at managing a live broadcast. And those skills are, in my opinion, the only reason why I have, like, even the 40 viewers I got right now. Like, I don't think it's because I'm, you know, I'm not Mr. Bill. I'm not Kenny Beats. I'm not going in making platinum chart and records. And I think that, like... If people can start to look at streams in a different mindset, it might help. Do you, does that make sense? I don't know if that makes total sense or not. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, um, I, I don't know if you knew this or not, but I actually came from YouTube and that was the whole, that was the whole goal of this in the first place was saying, Hey guys, like, here's how I teach. Here's how I share information and all that. And for the people that don't want or want more than a 10 minute video, Here's where you have a place to hang out to, you know, dive in and just geek out with people that like doing this kind of stuff like all of us. No, absolutely. We um, well, I'm actually kind of curious uh, since, you know, what are what would you say are your average view counts for your streams? All three of you. Oof. I know it's OK Four, four people, three people, <laughs> something around that. Mm -hmm. I have really inconsistent numbers. Um, Anywhere from none to sometimes 15. Okay. Funk mod on your rare uh, streams. So uh, for me, uh, what I've noticed is if I'm doing something that's more fun and fast paced where I'm not being as like technical, like spending like 30 minutes on a baseline or like an hour processing drums, that's actually why I do drum processing first when I do a stream. Cause like right. if I start doing drum processing, like halfway through the stream, I'll lose viewers. But like if I'm doing like a more fun stream, like anywhere from like eight to twelve, uh, more technical stream, probably like four or five. All right. Now to, to to follow up on that, when you say a more fun stream, how do you define a fun stream? Either as a and I'll I'll open this up uh, after you answer, uh, Jaron. Um, both as a producer and as a viewer. Um, and then I'm curious, like how we all feel like that kind of aligns essentially. 
Yeah, so um, I would define like a fun stream like <laughs> I think the most recent one I did, I did like a happy hardcore tune, which is like totally not my style of music at all. It just just for fun. And like the thing about it is like when you're doing quote unquote simpler genres, like you can your workflow is a lot faster. And I feel like that's more engaging. And like especially with like doing stuff that I'm just kind of shit posting. Um, I can add little jokes, like add me ask the chat what I should add before the drop or something like that. So mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. That's what was the other part skill. of your question? Sorry. <laughs> Oh, it's just like uh, not just as a streamer, but as or as a viewer. Like, what what do you find fun when you watch a stream? Like, if you're looking for someone to watch, what's your what's your qualifications? What's your categories of of good versus bad? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, they should be somewhat competent, but at the end of the day, like your personality is the biggest thing, and like being engaged with your audience like there's so many I, i've seen a lot of streams where people produce and they never interact with the chat and they they'll get a view count like boost and then everybody will leave because they're just bored <laughs> absolutely um i mean i i think you know i've i've noticed that um a lot especially if you go down to like the low view count like the like the zero viewer streams like have any of you ever like rated a, a zero viewer with like 10 or 15 people and then like they're like, oh wow, oh my god, I can't believe it. And then they just like Yeah, they look at the chat like every 15 minutes. Yeah. And it's a completely yeah. disconnecting environment. Um, but I'm curious, uh, for either Alchemy or DMTR, whoever wants to go first, what do you think about that as both again a streamer or a viewer? I'll go first. But the thing is, I'm like that guy who doesn't really interact with chats um, that much. Um, but I don't promote my stream as like educational or interactive. Uh, so like if you come into my stream, I'll just be producing and I'll explain stuff when you ask for it. But it's not like I'm looking for uh, that interaction that much, which is also why I have low view counts, um, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, because like I'm doing what I really like about Twitch. So I'm like the one viewer someone has who is just producing all the time and not really interacting with chat. I love those streams. And I just look at their workflow and just try to learn from them um, just by looking at it. And yeah, that's why I do the same thing. To give you a little bit of credit though, DMTR, in your chat, if somebody has a question, you actually answer it. Yeah, for sure. And sure. I'll go out of my way and to like give an in-depth answer and stuff, but I'm not like an educational streamer where I'll be tackling different objects every day. Um, I'll just be working on my project. And if something happens to come on the path of what I'm doing, um, they can surely ask about it. But yeah, nice. That's just my opinion. I dig it. What about you, Alchemy? I think it depends on what you're looking for out of a stream, you know? Um, I think one of the biggest things that I got to um, come out of this was when I found out that people like artists that I know were streaming, I wanted to watch them because kind of like TMCR, I wanted to look at, <laughs> sorry, trap. Uh, I wanted to see what they were doing and perhaps have an opportunity to inquire about some of their personal things, you know, um, but at the same time, like some people are here for education. Some people are here for entertainment. And it's kind of like, what are you, you know, what are you looking for? Kind of like with DMCR, one thing I like about hanging out is in his channel is he is just doing his own thing. And that can be kind of therapeutic in some ways of like not feeling like you have to be present in the moment. At the same time, for some people, one of the biggest things about Twitch is having the community environment. And I think the number one thing, regardless of what you're doing, is making somebody feel like they are here with you. Mm -hmm. You know, you could be doing absolutely nothing, but uh, if you do engage and, you know, you're fulfilling that role, then kind of the content on itself becomes subsequent in its own right. Oh, yeah, 100%. Like, with that, like, it, it really does speak to um, <clears throat> how important, uh, you know, community engagement is. Like, um, when I see someone in chat, I talk to them. When I... oh. <laughs> <laughs> he has to take care of a doggo. Anyways, um, <clears throat> when I am looking at streams that I think are doing well, um, I think one of the hallmarks <clears throat> of them is the fact that the 
chat is like consistently active and there are people mm. whether they're ship posting whether they're asking questions whether they're making comments across categories the highest streams have the most not viewers specifically but chatters like when you look at um say someone who has 10,000 viewers they're most likely only going to have a tenth of their chat chatting but 10,000 right. viewers, a tenth chatting, that's a thousand people chatting at the same time. And when you go down to smaller streams, you can see like that ratio increase and you can start to f gauge like if someone's at like 2% of their views or chatters, that's kind of for me at least it's a sign that there's something going on. But, you know, like DMTR was saying, you know, he likes the people who are just making beats they don't care about the chat they don't care about the community and i think or not the community but they don't care about like um putting on mm. an entertaining persona so to speak right um yeah, exactly. and i'm curious uh do you think that it's necessary to have growth or do you think that uh for you personally you find that um you know streaming is for a different purpose a different end goal rather than just getting more viewers essentially um yeah it's completely for a different end goal so streaming like i explained this to alchemy uh before uh we came onto this podcast already um but streaming is basically alchemy tried to like put me onto streaming uh simply because he said like why don't you show people your workflow and show people what you are doing um and that's basically why i started streaming and i didn't have the intent to become like a big streamer or an educational streamer. So I just stream my production. If people like it, that's great. If people have questions, I'll be there, but I'm not looking to get like uh, 50 viewers every stream I do. I'm just working on my music like I usually am, but instead I'm just streaming. Yeah, I can respect that. What about you other two? Go ahead, Funk. <laughs> just the pause. Uh, for me, honestly, like my goal, if I stream, <laughs> when I stream, is like um, just to like be a part of the community because like I feel like just being in Twitch chat sometimes feels a little bit weird. Like you, like nobody has a face to your name, kind of. Mm -hmm. But um. I guess the other thing that I like personally is I like when people backseat produce me because I <laughs> usually run out of ideas in like an hour and a half. And I'm like, I'm like, all right, I know you guys are producers. Like, give me, give me the, just give me a nugget so I can keep going. Because like when I'm just producing by myself, like if I do a production stream, I usually go for five or six hours just on a tuner or whatever. But like, honestly, when I'm sitting by myself, I get so discouraged after two hours because I feel like I ran out of ideas. So I just like, I like when people, I do it so people can backseat me. <laughs> like accountability almost too, right? I think on that okay. note, one thing I would like to see all of us try is like Twitch produces, kind of like Twitch plays, how they've done with Pokemon. Um, but just like you have, you have no say and you have to follow every command that's like within the thing. Um, that could definitely be fun. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Funk, were you done? No, no, I'm done. I'm just. Okay. I'm I just didn't, I have a tendency to like, jump on thoughts so I, I apologize if that happens to any of you guys um but i think that at the end of the day with streaming as far as the content creator uh, it has to be meaningful to us now some people think of like wanting to have a job out of it some people think of like wanting to join the community and all that but really it's what the what the goal is for for you um kind of like what uh, some people were saying in the chat as well for me i just want people to interact with and um, to share ideas with because I believe that this community right here has already helped me so much in my own production and my own understanding. And um, that's what it's about is sharing information. I come from a, a community called martial arts tricking. I don't know if you guys have heard of that before or not, yeah. but um, I'm in like, I, I, I'm an, I'm an acrobat or was, um, and we just had this thing where we do gatherings where people come from all over the world and people stay with you and then we all come together in one place and throw down you know, super hard tricks and stuff. And um, that's really something that I see within this community as well and that I wanna try to continue doing. Um, it's, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, 
and it's yeah it's kind of <laughs> i started music because of tricking so oh that's really cool see and that's i think that's kind of fun because it's like you know the background that we all bring in to producing or, or twitch or anything it's really going to inform the way that we perceive it um and <clears throat> like when we look at sort of tricking or looking at sort of the producer community i do feel like there is a sense of like friendly competition in a sense like uh um talking about you know the producer challenges and talking about like um the uh twitch plays production or whatever like i know matt zo has been doing things where it's like he'll turn off his speakers and he'll open up phase plant and he'll be like okay i'm gonna make the start of a snare tell me how to fix it and then the whole chat builds the snare and it's pretty fun it's yeah. really really engaging and um i think that also connects with sort of what uh, funk mod was saying about you know part of what makes people want to stream is actually being in streams like i've seen people come into my stream hang out for a couple of months and then all of a sudden be like hey i'm streaming and like mm -hmm. i think that it's actually you know it is it's really making you feel like you are part of a family going back to that and i think that is really like the for me the the theme of what we're going to talk about today is generally like we all have a community that we've started to build here and we're seeing in the past couple of weeks a lot of people encroaching either in a good or a bad way there's just so many more people entering our space and <clears throat> I think that, you know, there's going to be a lot of challenges that we have to face. Like, um, Widler was asking, you know, what about people who are going to have a lot of growth? Like, you know, how does someone like Kenny Beats talk to his chat when he has 2,000 people watching? Like, what are the considerations? Because right now, I got like 45 viewers. We got a about, you know, a dozen or so people talking in chat. I can kind of keep track of everyone. How's it going result? <laughs> and uh, it's easier to form personal relationships, to form these kinds of family bonds. But if you have like, you know, 500, 2,000, 10,000 viewers, like you can't talk to one person, but how, how do you or how would you approach that or do you think it even is a consideration open question yeah i just think it's a different beast like like if you want a tighter knit community you go to a smaller stream like like um well let me, let me think about this for one second okay. i'll let everybody can i add on to you funk um, if I if I may, I don't want to put words in your mouth because you might have a different perspective. But I think that you kind of look at things as restructuring. Um, it's the same. It's the same difference of teaching a private lesson versus teaching a class. And 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 I know that this is in terms of being you know educational or or whatever. But whenever you are speaking to somebody, you know, there's a much bigger difference between having an intimate relationship and then outwardly projecting something. So changing or prefacing the overall structure about how you go about your shows or your streams or whatever i think is going to be the most efficient way to kind of correct that if i have five thousand viewers in my chat depending on what i'm doing i might open up opportunities for somebody to send me something where i might be just paying attention to chat for a couple seconds of like hey everyone here's a question i'm looking at chat and then having that understanding of like yo like it's flowing like this i'm not going to be able to catch all of that or, you know, polls. I know that we do that sometimes on our Discord or, um, you know, kind of like what you guys already do as well. Like, I imagine if, sorry, I'm, uh, the ideas are connecting, but imagine if we had 5,000 people in the chat and 1,000 of them do a producer challenge. Well, that means that that's your whole stream. And that's great. And that's, to me, like, that would be an amazing accomplishment because you got a thousand different views and everybody is going to wait or talk or, you know, talk about these ideas and share things of that. And um, I think it's just kind of like restructuring your um, your perception on, like, how you, what you have available and what you have to change to, to reorganize. No, hmm. 100%. Um, I think, you know, on both of those, and I, and I, and DMTR, I do want to bring you in, but I just wanted to, I just want to comment on that point. Um, no. 
What's up? No, it's all good. I'm just... I just like DMCR being here. He's like my favorite. He's just along for the ride. <laughs> no. You're you're the, you're my man, man. Actually, you all are, but... But, I mean, yeah. I think, like, it is um, a factor of, you know, where the chat is going. You know what I mean? Like, when you have, like you're saying, like, you know... 5,000 people watching, 1,000 people submitting, like, there's going to be a lot of different types of engagement based on whether someone submitted or whether someone's just watching. And I think um, when you look at some of the larger streamers, when you look at sort of uh, the people who are kind of handling it appropriately, it's more that the chat feels like a unit then it feels like a collection of individuals. Does that make sense? Yeah. Kind of like going from, you know, in my chat, I can see Volan, I can see Whittler, I can see Result, I can see M, I can see all these people. But at some point, like, even for those people, and I've, I've fallen into this because I watch a couple of the, you know, the five, six, eight thousand, ten thousand 10,000 viewer streamers, and like, there are moments where it's like you see a bunch of Keck W's going through chat and you just go in, you just type K-E-K-W, you hit enter, yeah. and it's just you feel part of that. And that's like a different kind of community almost. Also, like what about the person-to-person -person interactions like beyond just the streamer in the chat? What about the people that are interacting within the chat themselves? Because mm -hmm. sometimes that can become or give its own life, you know? And maybe encouraging people to, you know, become on that so that way you don't have to pay as much attention to the chat or you have uh, mods in there or, you know, other other things of that nature because it becomes a whole unit like you said as opposed to i'm the your us or whoever you're streaming is the host and all the attention is here i'd much rather it be um as a means of everybody has you know a cool place that they can kind of you know interact with because it just allows more possibility 100 100 um, so yeah. i have another spicy take oh okay Oof. so you know how you interact with big streamers you pay them you donate. <laughs> that's also true. That is actually, that's a good point, honestly. Yeah. Um, but I think that's, you know, that gets into a whole other conversation, honestly, about like, well, I want to, before we get to that, though, because I want to I wanna hold that thought. I want to hold that thought because I do want to bring DMTR in on the previous topic. I want to hear your thoughts. Sorry, DMTR. On... <laughs> Sorry about that one. Um, I'm just... Like Funkmod actually made a good point uh, here, and like to further uh, enhance my way of thinking, um, like you said, the big chats are acting like a unit uh, to the streamer, and it's like basically teaching to enormous classrooms um, as a teacher. So you're not really um, knowing every individual um, that well. Um, but you're talking to them like a unit. And then when they actually donate or subscribe, um, they have their little moment of glory and in the sense that they're actually pronouncing their name. So it's like the first time they're actually breaking away from that unit and being like uh, enlightened or something. Um, but yeah, that's the way I see it. So you just have to, to treat it like a giant classroom. You're not talking to individuals anymore. You're making content that's uh, approachable for every single one of them. And yeah just let it live their own life well honestly like with with that and, th and that's a good actually segue into this next topic about like you know <clears throat> at least for me what funk mod is kind of getting to is sort of the relationship between a streamer and their audience like the the mm -hmm. whole question of the parasocial relationship because you know i would say that i've made friends with a bunch of my viewers I like all of you have been in my streams as viewers and I hang out with you. I talk to you off discord on discord in other people's Twitch chats. We have like, I keep coming back to this community. We have this family, but there are also a lot of people who they start to develop a personal relationship with the streamer just through watching. Mm -hmm. And when you're with a smaller streamer, it's easier to kind of blur that line and stuff. But when you get towards someone who has, you know, like even 300, 400, 500 views, like how often is that something where, whether they're doing it intentionally or not, kind of exploiting the nature of the conversation? You know what I'm saying? Like, 
people coming in. Like they want to talk to the streamer. They want to feel like they have a relationship with the streamer. The streamer's not going to read their message in chat, but they have a text to speech. You pay four dollars. They can mm-hmm. hear your voice, so to speak. Is that good? Is that bad? Is that neutral? Like I, I don't know. It's a really weird conversation topic. Um, so I'm, I, I don't claim to know the answer there. Yeah, for me, it just depends on the viewer. I think, like, um, as a viewer going into like a five K uh, stream, I wouldn't really expect to have the same interaction as I would join like a fifty viewer stream. And if you do have that same expectation, um, that might be a problem for your wallet. Like, um, it's more like a responsibility for the viewer than the streamer, in my opinion. So, yeah. Sam. I'm not, I'm a bit surprised by that. I'm a bit surprised that like, it's so like, I don't know. Do we think that, um, there's nothing streamers can do to try to like manage that? Or is it like kind of, it sounds like you're saying, you know, it's not even really a responsibility. Yeah, yeah, they certainly can, but it's like, I have rarely seen people going over 5k viewers and not uh like making use of the fact that they're having a text-to-speech with donations yeah yeah the social possibilities sorry oh no 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 i was just thinking like um people like dr disrespect or something he's like an even bigger exception because he's so big he doesn't even have text-to-speech so yeah there it's just completely thrown out of the window but um i think that like one thing that's important to consider is that we all have social media outside of twitch and one thing that i think that we all do is we open up those avenues to you know to people that have different stuff um for example um you know we we both have a discord channel and we have different things like maybe if somebody is submitting for tune feedback and they don't get it and they really want feedback providing another place or another way for having or giving them access to that um, is kind of the next best thing but in regards to developing relationships and stuff like i wouldn't be surprised if a lot of those people uh, become your mods or something you know or like raising up in the higher hierarchy if that's even a thing or giving them, you know, some other kind of access, or sometimes it can even just be as one of those things of like, so like, you know, uh, if you have a Patreon, right, sometimes you don't hear from someone from a long time, and they're still a patron. And sometimes like just sending someone an email of being like, hey, you know, I just want to give you a personal message and still remain and still keep those personal, you know, relationships open, even though the stream is blowing up and there isn't that much opportunity to have those one on one conversations. Because there are, you know, times and places. But again, as you grow, you do kind of have to just shift the overall attitude of that, in my opinion. 100%. Um, anyone else mm-hmm. want to add on to that? I completely agree. Looks like it. No, but that's okay. Um, I look, kind of. I wanna. I wanna address something that uh, Whittler mentioned because it, it does tie in with this, like kind of your community and stuff. Let's like, you know, <clears throat> if you had say like a twenty minute challenge, like Whittler and I do on our streams and stuff, but <laughs> instead of like, <coughs> excuse me, coronavirus. No, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, instead of like, no, I'm kidding. I haven't been outside in like three months. Um, instead of like 10 or 5 or 20 people or 20 people you have like 50 people submitting and everyone's submitting 20 seconds of music even if that's 20 seconds 50 times 20 is a lot of minutes (laughs) um and it's like what like what can be done to preserve the atmosphere that we get from these challenges when it comes to becoming a bigger streamer. And I will say real quick, I apologize to everyone that we're going into streamer problems. I don't wanna be a streamer problems podcast. I know there's plenty of other people who do streamer problems podcasts, shout out train wrecks. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it is like, it's gonna be a thing. Like as the music community grows, like invariably not there's not just going to be people who are coming onto the platform 
with big audiences. There's going to be people who come in and they grow. Like they see themselves go from like a 20 or a 30 to a 50 or an 80 or a 200 viewer streamer. And that changes the way that they approach their streams. Like, so, you know, I would say like, I would not be surprised if Widler, for example, becomes twice as big as he is right now on Twitch. What would he do? Uh, try and get so better. there's actually a case of this recently. Oh, so really? Okay. On Tuesday, um, was it Tuesday? Anyways, Whitler did a DJ stream and mm -hmm. his viewer count tripled. And there's no way that he can he can keep up with the chat. It's just impossible. And if you imagine that even like 10% of those people start coming into his stream, that's, and they are producers, mind you, probably most of them aren't, but if they start posting tracks and they're also new to it, because I've noticed this thing a lot where like, it's not the fault of the person that posts it, but people that are new seem to try to enter two to three minute progressive trance tracks for, for like challenges and like take up all the time kind of. Um, but yeah, like, especially the challenges, I, I think there, there needs to be a time limit. Like that's the number one thing I see is people are posting things that are too drawn out and too long. Like it's an idea, not a song. I think that's actually a really good point, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> In regards to if once you have more submissions, you know, um, here's a different question, I guess, and you don't have to answer this. And I'm not really like, we don't have to get into the semantics of it. But based on the viewer count that um, using, I guess, the model of you and Whittler have whenever you guys do producer challenges, how many, how many submissions do you have on average per challenge? And how many challenges do you are you able to fit in per stream? Because if you say, hey, you know, you dedicate a single day to one, you know, one or two challenges, and then you open that up for submissions for everybody to be heard, then you have necessarily, you might have more time in order to highlight everybody. But likewise, if you're doing something shorter or whatever, then that kind of goes along with Funk Mods thing too, of like, I swear, every time you guys do a challenge, somebody always breaks the rules and it's a meme and I love it. But at the same time, like, yeah, someone's always breaking the rules. So you know, that's kind of where I feel like the reformatting comes in of like, you got a lot of submissions, so you're not going to do as many challenges, or maybe there's something else or some or some new kind of content that you can spawn out of doing that, um, where like you talk about a specific person's or whatever out of a raffle or, you know, like, there's there's a lot of different options. But of course, like at the end of the day, like you're not going to have as many challenges with as many people because we just don't have that kind of time. Oh, no, 100%. Like, and <clears throat> when you you know, when I try to do like a lot of challenges in a stream or do I a lot of stuff, like I had a feedback stream uh, on Friday where I was like, I'm just going to go until my ears get tired because it's, you know, everyone's in quarantine, everyone's trying to socially distance. I'm just going to go. I went for like 10 and a half hours of stream Jeez. and that shit is intense. Like if you want to try and fit people in, like, it takes a while and you know it it really kind of sucks it feels like i feel guilty when i don't get to do a whole bunch of feedback i feel guilty when i'm getting to the end of my feedback streams and people are like i've been in line since you started the feedback at noon and it's now 9 30 what do i do right. and it's like well when... they could use their free twitch subscription <laughs> to subscribe to musar music and had to look to find my name luck. I mean, that's kind of the, you know, that's kind of what it comes down no, to, definitely. though, you know, eventually. And the other thing, too, that I hope that I try to explain this to other people, um, because I remember the last time you were on a podcast, I, I, I don't remember who it was with, but you were talking about how um, sometimes feedback is really mentally draining on you. Um, and that's because it is. If you think about it, you know, dedicating the time to listen to something critically and then come up with something to say about it and having some kind of like not just this is cool or whatever, but some kind of creative input can potentially just, it, it takes a toll on you. It's not to say it's not fun or anything, but if you have that perspective, then it's definitely going to be a lot harder. Likewise, you know, um, something that DMTR and I actually talked about was like, he mentioned that a lot of times he likes giving feedback to things because it helps him with his ideas. Is that correct? Am I putting words in your mouth, DMTR? 
No, no, completely. Okay, not. just making sure. Um, but it helps us. It helps inspire us to incorporate some of these ideas in our own music and helps us problem solve without it having to be our own content. To what degree of how long you're able to do that is kind of up to the individual. Um, but either way, you know, I think having a, a perceptive or a common ground or a common perception of who's giving feedback and who is receiving feedback um, can be the most important thing whenever that that interaction occurs. So, like for me, whenever people send me stuff, I'm like, hey guys. I don't have the I don't have the analytical tools to pull up right now, so I'm going to do creative feedback, and I prefer you send me a work in progress because if the song is done, you might be able to learn something, but I'd much rather help you with something that you're going to be more motivated to change, and it it, it kind of you know it's not perfect, but it helps a little bit more. Oh yeah, no, definitely. I mean, <clears throat> honestly, like with feedback, I think it's it is. <laughs> It's funny because it's kind of like the forbidden currency, yeah. if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm not trying to call anyone out, but right now I'm going to be showing off some other streamers' uh, discords. Specifically, I want to show off the feedback channel from Mr. Bill's Discord. And there's a lot of people being active right here. If you look on screen, you can see people talking. But let's just scroll up, and let's just start seeing how often there's just, like, a song being posted. There's a ton of times where it's just you got songs that are like nothing. Can I get some feedback? 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 Look at all these people who are just posting barely anything being written. A couple people being really nice, but very rarely, here's the thing. Very rarely do I see someone posting a song for feedback and then later on, giving other people feedback. A lot of people tend to, and we can go into, I'm actually gonna call out one more streamer, not on purpose, but no offense, Wid. Nothing personal, Wid, but wow. Look at all these people who just, they share their tune and they don't do anything. They don't help other people. They don't give a lot of feedback. There's still people who do that. Like obviously, clearly Albamity right here is doing great. But there's so many times where there's someone who just posts a track and never, ever, ever does anything else. And, you know, it's gotten to the point where, like, my uh, my feedback channel is actually, like, you get kicked from the server <laughs> if you don't give other people feedback and you just ask. You just get kicked from the server. I have a very clear policy on that. And... On one hand, it means that uh, the people who do ask for feedback are giving feedback. But on the other hand, it means that people now feel like they don't have a space to get education. And it's a double-edged sword. Um, so I feel like, you know, the whole feedback issue is, like, it's, it's tumultuous. And it's why, like... You know, feedback streams have always been, like, the consistent way to grow on Twitch. If you, yeah. Like, just an open question real quick. Who here has done feedback streams? Never. Okay, so Alchemy has done feedback. You two haven't. I'm sure there are people who, in my Twitch chat who have. Now, for anyone who has done feedback streams, do you find that it gives you more or less viewers? Always more. Exactly. Easy easy exactly always more viewers just from doing feedback literally my biggest streams are just from doing feedback and right. you know part of me feels like it sets a bad precedent but i don't know like I, go for it sorry no, go i'm ahead. so sorry no it's all good uh, don't even sweat it i was i was just rambling at that point so go ahead it depends. Um, and this is really important because um, I guess a similar perspective is if anybody knows me, I, I come from teaching martial arts. And um, one thing that I always used to butt heads with my teacher on was like, um, I love kids, but I didn't want to teach kids forever. And he told me that part of wearing that hat was like, the kids are where the money's at. You know, that's all of those classes, that's where all of those things are going to, you know what I mean? All those things are going to come in and then teaching the adult class of like the more like university style class is where you like fulfill yourself. So if you treat Twitch as a job, then 
I think that's one of those things that would I think that's one of those things that I'm breaking. Sorry. It's all right. They can see that don't worry, chat's visible, so people know exactly what you're laughing at. Um it's one of those things that you kind of like it comes with the territory, yeah, of understanding that, you know, there are gonna be some of these things that might not be your favorite. And how you how you shape your attitude across that is kind of like how you how you deal with it of some sort. But yeah, you're definitely right. The feedback streams are always the biggest because that's that's what people are looking for. And for all of you guys who are out there and have either engaged in feedback and all that stuff, uh, one thing that DMTR and I were talking about, he's on my on my right, so that's why I point that way, is um, try to search for a community that's going to give you the feedback that you're looking for. Um, as opposed to just, hey, can you listen to this? Because, you know, if somebody produces metal or something and you come into a DMB tune or DMB artist or something, it's not going to necessarily fit your, you know, fit. You're not going to get what you need out of it. And um, I think that that's part of like your own personal responsibility with finding yourself as an artist, kind of like what you were talking about on stream earlier. Of Who are these people? Who are these, you know, what are they doing? And do does my mindset and my ideas coincide with what these people are expressing themselves? Oh, no, 100%. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm curious, for the people who don't stream feedback on this platform, uh, aka the two people who have not been talking enough on this podcast. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> well, what do, what do you guys think about like the environment uh do you find yourself uh searching out feedback streamers or do you find yourself like even in your own streams avoiding feedback for a specific reason and if there is one why is that um yeah i guess i'll go first um so the reason why i don't do feedback streams is because i first of all, don't have the tools to give people proper feedback on stream live. So I'm trying to stay away of it because I don't want to like uh, give them things that are not uh, really uh, searching to hear. Um, and the other thing is I, when I give feedback to people, I want it to be like really in depth and really specific. So that's why almost the only feedback I give is in uh, private messages. So, and that's mostly in Alchemy's Discord. Um, there are a couple of people who I talk to regularly, who I give the permission to send me their tracks, their progress throughout the year. And they just send me projects every time they have something new. And I give feedback on it um, the same way, try to encourage them to get better. Um, but like, yeah, it's not really like a concept that works on stream because I can do that with everyone. Um, so that's why I try to keep it separate. Feedback is for me off stream and production is on stream. Pretty fair. Yeah. Pretty fair. What about you, Monk Mod? Uh, so I have, like, I enjoy getting feedback every once in a while. Um, like, honestly, the only people I ask for feedback from are The Whittler and Sh Shroomhead. But that's just because, like, they make similar music to me and I know that they're going to give me the feedback that's going to get me to the final stage. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but um, a lot of the time, like I don't ask for feedback necessarily or seek out feedback streams because like it, it, as pretentious as it might sound, a lot of the people giving feedback don't really have like, a big like standing in the music industry so i kind of don't care about their feedback like it's not really that valuable to me whereas if i get it from somebody that's established at least i know i'm going down the right path um and then i guess the reason like what i don't do feedback on my streams i mean occasionally i'll do it between breaks like if i need a break from working on a song or something oh, yeah, totally. um but at the end of the day, like the best feedback that I could give to anybody is just make more music. And like the thing is, is I also don't want to taint what they're going to end up doing, you know, because I want them to go on their own path. I don't want them to be on the same path as me because that doesn't make 
very interesting art in my opinion no i get that like kind of knowing because it's with that you know a lot of the problem i find with you know feedback channels on discords is like you don't know who's gonna respond you don't know whether you know they've been producing for six months or six years or six decades um and like i strongly encourage people to be skeptical of feedback streamers like i'm not going to call anyone out by name but there are definitely people who uh they stream pretty consistently in terms of uh when they do feedback streams and every time i've seen them stream i've been like wow that person is totally just doing this for clout and there's a lot of people who they're doing feedback because they see the bigger streamers doing it and they saw that it gets some viewers and you know a lot of times when like, you know what my i'm going to what my like number one pet peeve is is when i go to someone's stream and i'm going to put my webcam on for a second and then you just see like this like you're just you're just watching the streamer and then it's just like um there's just a song playing and you just see someone just okay yeah that was pretty cool that was really cool i think maybe you should add some compression i think maybe you should uh revisit the mix but really cool song all right next track <laughs> and it's like it's the most fucking like lazy thing because what what information do you actually get from looking at a soundcloud link what does that actually teach you? And I don't know. I feel like it's it's so easy to get caught up in it that, um, like, I wish people would have the confidence to reference, essentially. But I feel like people just, there. there's, like, a lot of stigma against it. And I just, I don't know. I wish that we could stop doing feedback streams altogether maybe that's a, maybe that's a hot take but i just i feel like feedback streams are not productive i don't think they help people as much as people think they help yeah um, and wouldn't you say most of the time like the best advice you could be is move on to another song honestly well i i think it depends on on the individual um something to consider is uh what you're you know for one what are you yeah that's that's exactly where i'm going at whittler uh two questions or sorry so two points so the first one is like i something that might be worth considering is actually listening to a song from beginning to end um some people have the the style of like anytime they hear something they cut the music down and they say okay right here this is where xyz and then some people give you the the whole idea of actually, you know, listening to something from beginning and end and then also giving something there. Uh, because, again, I, I do think that we are listening to the song um, unless if you are doing technical feedback, to which then, yeah, you if you're going to be prepared for that, then you definitely should have, you know, analysis tools up. Um, but sometimes whenever you're just trying to get ideas or something, you know, I, I, one thing that I try to consider, too, within feedback is it's not just me giving feedback. A lot of times DMCR comes in while I'm giving feedback and he's like, hey, uh, to, to another to another person of like, hey, I think this idea is really cool and this idea is really cool. And to me, that's actually really satisfying when everybody is on the same thing of like we're all looking at it as a group, almost like a council and being like, yo, here's, you know, here's this idea and here's what we all think. And that way you can take the collective of inputs. Um, but that does bring the question of like, in that particular case, you know, say like, you know, say we all did stop doing feedback streams, like what do you think is the best means of exchanging information or collecting ideas for songs for, you know, if we run into choice paralysis or if we do get stuck on a song or if we don't know what to do for our next project? That's a good point. Honestly, like I, I want to I want to I want to address that. I actually want to tie that in with a topic that the Whittler was talking about, about like. You know, if you get stuck on a song, do you power through it or do you move on? I think for a lot of people, they go for feedback because they aren't sure of the answer to that question. It kind of goes into what you're saying. Like, where do people go for that information? I mean, like, my my personal idea is, like, 
you don't really need feedback as long as you know how to reference. Like there is no amount of information I can speak at someone that will teach them more than studying their favorite songs, remaking them, looking at them through analyzers, figuring out the chord progressions, figuring out the sound design, like just essentially brute forcing someone else's work and using that to teach you. And I find that like, at least in my own experience, part of the reasons why I don't ask for feedback from pretty much anyone is because I feel that um, I am better served finding references and going from that and the person who I would be asking for feedback is better served with doing literally anything else with their time. But that's just me. So do you think that maybe one of the one of these answers is kind of like what you were doing on stream earlier of putting time and effort into educating someone how to critically listen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that is a, a key skill. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can definitely get down with that. Um, in most cases, you know, because um, sometimes there are just, just those instances where nothing works. And, you know, the thing about like beat block or whatever is sometimes it's up to the individual to figure those things out. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I definitely think that if we set a precedent of making people more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, independent, on their own personal studies and how to, you know, do all those things, then I think that the kind of feedback, if we were to continue that, would actually be much different. That's a good point. Um, I kind of, I, I want to, I do really want to talk about um, the, the, the beat block and the producing thing, but kind of, I, I also want to touch on like sort of this last thing on feedback, which would be like the difference between, as you mentioned, like creative feedback versus technical feedback. Do we think they're the same thing? Like I have the meme. I don't. Oh, it's not. It's not actually showing up on this scene. But imagine. Imagine I have the big subjective opinion time thing flashing on screen right now. Mm. Right. Um, what do we? What do we feel about like the value of those? Um, like, and do we think that there is as much of a difference? Like, is there actually such a thing as objective feedback? Can you, like, truly say X Y Z song has this problem with the mix? Or are we going to try and go, every song is special if the artist wants it that way? And frankly, I don't think that's true. Um, the way I see it, I think there is definitely some kind of uh, difference between the creative and the technical feedback. And the technical feedback, I, to me, like the thing that Whittler does um, is super great. So he shows like every meter and your mix and he just points out stuff. He doesn't say if it's bad or if it's good um, most of the time, but he just points out stuff. There is a lot of high ends. He doesn't really tell you that the high end is bad, um, but just being mindful about uh, those different things can give you inspiration to get your uh, technical level up. Um, the subjective opinion, um, stuff is important for some people not for everybody of course um, but um, when alchemy does his feedback streams people actually come with the intent of hearing uh, new perspectives toward their uh, work in progresses so they're actually trying to um, hear different uh, opinions about it um, and then go from there they, they might just totally ignore them but at least they know what possible path um, the music could have taken um, so yeah, that's the way I think about it. Good point. I think it's important as like, um, I kind of consider you and I, uh, Musar, as somewhat of an educator, also student, you know, because we're all on the same path together. 100%. But I, I think the most important thing is teaching a perspective and allowing everybody to try to see all of the doors that are available and letting them make their own choice. And mm -hmm. kind of when we take those things where we where things become objective is the mindset that we allow ourselves to come into so an example would be like if i'm trying to sound like this person we are automatically putting ourselves in a specific structure but if someone's just like i just want to finish the tune or something then that opens up a completely different you know world of possibilities because that is kind of the whole thing with with art it's something that we call like shaping the expression right it's one mm -hmm. thing to express yourself but how you shape it is something completely different I agree with that, actually. That's actually a really good point. I like that. It's very poetic, honestly. 
So I have a take on this. Um, <laughs> Go for it's it. It's not a spicy one. Uh, Finally. It's, uh, oh. um, so for me personally, because I, I don't do most community stuff, but for me personally, like I prefer the subjective opinion because most of the time I know this song isn't finished. And I'm in the process of finishing it. And I know that at, like my level, I know that all those things are going to be checked by the time I put it out. Like to me, those are just like, I'm not even in that, that part of the process yet. So like somebody saying, Oh, there needs to be more fills or Hey, like, it'd be cool if you did a variation on this for me is a lot more fruitful because I'm not even too finalizing the song. And like, I feel like a lot of technical stuff is finalizing it. And I think a lot of people get stuck in that. And they think that once they get the technical feedback, your song is good to go. Yeah. And a lot of time that's, that's just not the case. Like there needs to be maybe more variation or there needs to be more harmonies or, you know, and it's just polishing something that's not even complete a lot of the time. And I feel like for me, that's why I think the subjective opinion is more useful, especially for producers that are just coming up because they're, they're going to like, I mean, I'll put faith in them that they're eventually going to learn all the technical stuff. But I think for me, especially, I learned all the technical stuff first and all the creative stuff I've been doing over the last year or two. And honestly, like it's breaking all this, all the rules that I had set before. And knowing why you have the rules for the technical feedback when you have the artwork already done, I think is a lot more fruitful. I guess to add to that, like one question that you might want to ask yourself if you're searching for feedback is, do you want to get feedback from a scientist or an artist? Ooh. That's, kind of, that's kind of what it comes down to. For me personally, I always send all my work in progresses to Funk Mod because he tells me my tunes aren't dark enough. So I'm like, all right, well, I got to make it heavier. I got to make it more angry. Works out great. I dig it. I'm with that 100%. Um, all right, cool. Let's 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 pivot a little bit because I do want to touch on the beat block thing because we've been we've been putting that off. Whittler made a, a really good point. Um, let me scroll back up in chat to get that. Um, where is it? Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, do you power through or you move on if you're stuck on a track? Like, and his his example was Mr. Bill. Um, and you can watch Mr. Bill's uh, tutorials or Mr. Bill's streams and like dude will work on a baseline for like 20 minutes, move on, and then like an hour later come back and completely change the baseline. Yeah. Like he just pushes. And I, and I think that um, honestly, the two things that I've found as common amongst people who I look up to as artists, is specifically uh, they give up less often. They stop less often. And two, um, they have a very refined sense of taste. They don't just know what they like. They know what they don't like, and they refine that. So, you know, I feel as though in most cases pushing through is better um but obviously like there's some things where your brain just doesn't have the information i know mr bill has also had his tracks where like he works on it for like eight hours and then he shit cans it so well, what about yeah. the rest of you do you find yourselves you know powering through more often and does it ch uh change whether or not you think the song is good or you know what do you what do you feel about how to get through this issue I think you should talk to these guys because they finish more music than I do for sure. Um, I would say it depends on your end goal, right? Like if you want to release tracks, then you need to get tracks done. If you just feel like exploring for a while, that's fine too. Yeah, that's fair. Do you, well, well, what about the idea of, of pushing through? Like, do you think people should be pushing themselves to complete more music overall or is it still just contextual? Um, I think it depends. Like, um, I mean, I think if you push through, you get better at pushing through, right? And for me personally, I just, 
I don't push through very often, <laughs> to be honest. Like I, for every track I put out, there's probably 40 or 50 whips, you know, but I, I'm okay with that. I'm comfortable with my artistic process. And I think, um, you got to find what works for you. Like for me, a lot of the time I'm just developing a style. And I know that the first track I make in that style is not going to be a reflection of what I want the end product to be. So I'll do it 20 times until I'm like, oh, this variation works kind of in this style and these kind of drum sounds kind of bass line. And I'm perfectly OK with that because I, I kind of see it as a stepping stone. And I also think you should push through occasionally because you, there you'll find definitely faults in your workflow, um, like for me. One of the, my biggest things that I hate doing is second drops. I don't know if you guys have problems with those, but second drops are like the most daunting thing for me. I'm just like, uh, what do I just get a copy and paste it to play it out. And uh, maybe eventually I'll think of a second drop. That's interesting. I get that. I get that. Uh, what about you, DMTR? Do you find yourself mm -hmm. uh, pushing through more often or do you find yourself just like work on it if it doesn't work, move on to the next song and just keep going until one clicks or? Um, the process actually changed a lot over the last uh, two years, actually. Um, so in the beginning, my I produced for like seven or eight years right now. And the first six years was basically exploration. I've had different analysis uh, where I tried to finish music and put music out. Um, but after like six years, I decided to create DMPR. Um, and that's actually a point where I decided I didn't need to finish music because I was like, I'm going to explore every different thing I can. Um, I'm just going to make whips for like a year, two years, how long, however it takes. Um, and then uh, last year, I actually got to the point where I was confident in my own skill and my own production uh, methods. Um, that I actually started finishing tracks and I just switched like a knob in my head and started pushing through. And right now I think 90% of the projects I start, I actually try to get finished. Um, so I'm very conservative about what projects I uh, start at the moment. And another uh, little thing that changed for me production wise is having the idea of a song in your head and trying to recreate it in a Duh. that was like the first thing um that, what <laughs> nothing's um, happening nothing's happening uh so in the beginning um like i had so much ideas and i'm trying to like recreate those ideas in my DAW. um but actually right now the way i start new projects is with a blank space in my head so i don't know what's going to happen i don't really think about it too much because if i'm stressed about what i'm going to do things don't go well so um yeah it's like i'm just trying to uh have like the least amount of technical knowledge the least amount of creative uh, inspiration when i'm trying to get into my DAW, because i know subconsciously i've been working on it the past few years so i know those things will be fine in the end um, and i'm just trying to explore and let the music take me where i want that music to be and not really um where i want that music to be in a certain uh, space yeah oh, that's interesting okay for sure so, yeah it's my... you like you like DMCR? Oh well, what about you, Alchemy? Because I know you you're saying you're you're dealing with some beat block lately. You're having trouble finishing the tunes, and I know I I struggle with the same thing. So how do you how do you feel? Like, do you find that like, you know, you're abandoning projects more, or do you find that you're just like you're put you're pushing and you're pushing and just like nothing seems to be working? And like, you know, what do you think you might be able to do to? you know, get yourself out of it. And obviously if you knew you would be doing that, but yeah, no, definitely. I think like one really cool thing that I always admire about all of the people that are here on Twitch and stuff is their ability to um, relieve themselves of their ego and um, just allow themselves to make music for the sake of making music. For me, I have such an analytical nature on things that like, if I can't do something, then I want to figure out why I can't do it. So one question that I was going to bring up um, that is a somewhat of a tangent, but but still kind of on the same path is instead of thinking of, you know, why do I have, you know, beat block or whatever, 
what does it take for us as individuals to finish a song? You know, what are, what are the components or at what point, at what point or how far do you get in a tune where you will say, okay, I'm going to finish this or, okay, this is worth finishing. And it's not the right perspective. It is a perspective. Um, but those are some things that I think about. And um, it was actually really cool because I was talking to these two guys earlier before we got on with you and you were talking about some workflow stuff. And one of the videos and all that that I was doing was getting ready to put together just a huge compilation of different potential workflows that I've accumulated over time and bringing that to the public. And it's not to say that it's going to be the end all be all, but the thing to overcome is figuring out the next choice to make because that's what beat block is, is not knowing what to do next, right? Totally. So overcoming that can happen in lots of different ways and faces and different shapes and all that stuff. But the, I think one of the most important things for me, sorry for the tangent, by the way, is creating, um, creating the vibe or creating the feel and giving something the soul that I think that a song needs, you know? Because if it's just noise and it's just layered on top of itself, then um, it's easy for me to forget because the song itself is forgettable. But when you establish an emotional connection, at least as far as me, I'm like, damn, like I feel this and I need to complete this idea or I need to take it somewhere. Then that's when, you know, all those, you know, kind of vibes and waves start to come into play. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's interesting because like when you were when you were talking about like, you know, it's not the right perspective, but it is a perspective. At a lot of times, that's really what I feel this stuff comes down to. Where, like, you know, it's not a matter of you not knowing uh, the right choice. It's that you just don't know what to choose. Right. So, like, honestly, one thing that's helped me a little bit, not in terms of, like, finishing songs, but in terms of getting songs closer to being finished um has been like this concept of it it doesn't matter if i make an arbitrary choice as long as i make a choice as long right. as i do something and <clears throat> i i think that this sort of ties in with uh something that i've i've noticed in my own productions um and i'm i'm curious how y'all find this uh if i spend too much time on one element of something without spending enough time on the entire arrangement, kind of like the macro structure of the song, it's way less likely to be finished. Like if I spend two hours writing this kick drum or making the design this kick drum, and then I start writing a track, I'm not going to finish it. But if I grab like a kick for my sample pack and I grab like a couple bass samples and I start just creating a groove, you know, automating some different filters. And then like I create the intro and like, I don't even worry about like, oh, I need, you know, to spend four hours making sure this Reese bass sounds dank. I'm just trying to write a tune, bro. And right. the tune comes out and I, I feel like my music comes when I am not questioning anything at all. And I'm curious, like, do you find it similar where it's like your best songs or your most complete songs come from that, like, either flow state or um, the times when you're not dialing in on the details? Or do you find that you can still kind of, like, zoom out, so to speak? Imagine if, imagine if you had all of the sounds that you ever wanted in order to make a song. How easy would it be for you to create? The flip side of that is, you know, for all of us who are sound designers and do all this stuff, we're making these new and experimental things. And how much imagination do we have when we try to hear these in context? So something that I try to consider is looking at things with developing an imagination for the sounds that you make. And that can be done through exercises. It's something that I need to practice more myself, but of saying like because you know we've all developed a workflow or understand the workflow of sound design arrangement mixing mastering you know effects transitions etc right but how often do you actually hear that because a lot of times when you're making a sound you hear it in somebody else's tune and so you know that's that's kind of part of it but likewise if you get a sample pack like you're just beginning 
right? And you don't know nothing about music and you're just like, I'm going to throw something together. Then a lot of times, like you said, you don't have to make, you have less choices that you have to make. And so it naturally does become easier, I feel. 100%. What about the other two? I, I have a I have a follow-up for that, but I'm going to I'm gonna save it until after we hear from Funk Mod and DMTR. So I have kind of an analogy to other art forms a little bit on this one because that's how I think about it. But um, a lot of the time when you're doing a drawing, you you first start with the composition and it's just placing things in space, right? And it, you don't have any detail. You're just trying to figure out the main structure. And when you start figuring out the main structure, you start developing the shapes, the form. And when you start after that, that's when you start adding details and stuff. I think that's how you get a more cohesive piece. Like you're saying you work on the one kick drum for two hours, and then there's this hyper kick, detailed kick drum, and then you have to get everything else up to the level of that kick drum, and you might not have the skills, unfortunately, to get it up to that other sound. Like uh, a lot of sound design genres you'll hear, they might have a very crazy bass line or something, and then their drums aren't aren't like quite up to par, or the atmosphere is not quite up to yeah, par. Yeah, traps near So seven. I think a lot of it for me, I try to, yeah, <laughs> but um, just getting the structure down so you can enter the flow state, but also make sure you're not you're you're going at the macro level, like you said. Um, so yeah, I I try to think about it as like in other art forms like sculpture, painting, drawing, that kind of stuff because that's how you get something cohesive. And if your track isn't cohesive, then it's not a strong idea. And the strongest ideas come from the flow state. Yeah, in my opinion. Oh yeah, building. You want to say something about me? Oh, I was actually going to ask DMCR if he would mind sharing um, some of his processes that he does to get consistent mixes. Um, I found it pretty interesting. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the first thing I wanted to touch on this topic is uh, like for me personally has been a big part of it is experience. Um, and more so um, back to the previous topic, the experience of making a lot of different work in progresses. Um, so the two year span of making work in progresses has forced me to make a lot of decisions. and. Even though uh, I quit all those projects, I still learned from making those decisions. If they were bad or good, that doesn't really matter to me. Um, but right now, when I'm writing a, writing a new project, I'm still forced to make decisions, but I have the experience of being in those same environments because I have so many different work in progresses lying around. So I've always been in that specific situation. Um, so that's why I think experience plays such a big role in getting your tracks finished. Because um, like how Funkmod uh, approaches his tracks, I do it completely differently. I just start from like the intro, I can perfect it, then make a build up, uh, perfect that as well, and just build up a track like that. Um, it's always a different process for some reason. Um, but like the decision making, is all based on experience. I, I've been in so much different situations um, that I know what to do when I'm presented with like a great kick drum and shitty bass sound. Then I know what to go from there and how to finish my track. Um, yeah, and that's how I look at it. <laughs> totally. Do you wanna do you wanna talk your uh, little thing about mixing tips, or do you wanna save that for? Uh, Tips, I don't think it's really a tip. Um, it's just a personal thing I do. Um, and oops, and I wouldn't really recommend <laughs> um, other people doing uh, doing it. Um, but when I was streaming, Alchemy uh, joined my stream and he asked me what was uh, placed on my master. Um, and back when I was really shitty at mixing, um, I decided to throw uh, a multi-band compressor uh, on my master to kind of act as a blueprint uh, for my end mix. So my, my mix in the end would um, be like um, kind of in the same ratio as the as the multi-band compressor. Um, so when, right now when I produce, I can enable that multi-band compressor uh, at any stage of my production and I mix into it because I know the blueprint I made always sounds 
the same, always sounds good and always sounds like a DMT or a mix. Um, yeah, and that's like the mixing thing I do. So yeah, every mix sounds exactly the same. And yeah, if it's quality, then it works. I didn't mean to call you out on that, but I thought that it went well with um, with what Funk Mod was saying about like if you make a specific kick and then trying to make everything else sound, you know, of that same caliber. I mean, just kind of like prefacing, right? And I think that one thing that builds on experience is kind of like knowing what you're going to potentially run into in the first place, you know, of something being off or whatever. Uh, a, a similar approach would be like if you're processing mid sounds or whatever, you just use the same processing chain and throw different things in through that to get a similar result. But um, I was actually really like captivated by uh, by his by his thing because I, I thought that was a really cool way to do that. And once you have something you're happy with, then you have your own reference. And how cool is that to reference your own music? But one thing that's interesting with this as well is, you know, uh, some people say that our consciousness is bound by our experiences, but I think that there comes into a point of like, if you continue to make the same experiences for yourself, whether knowingly or unknowingly, um, how do you, you know, come into a point where you do branch out? Because some people say that like insanity is when you do the same thing over and over again, expecting something different. So, you know, to what awareness we all have is is a different question, but sometimes that's kind of what it is as far as like you know some of the things that you were talking about about figuring out who you are as an artist of being like yo i've been trying to make a song by starting with a beat for years and at what point do you make that decision to try a different approach or you know where do you find you know that level of creativity oh no 100 percent. and i, I think <clears throat> to, to tie that in a little bit with what uh, funk mom was talking about earlier i think you know, making comparisons to other art forms is crucial here. Um, no matter which which part of this we're talking about, um, like when when we talk about sort of getting the ideas out and sort of establishing a lot of those um, kind of formal beginnings, like the the thing that I immediately jump to is like I have a lot of friends who are into digital illustration, and you know what they don't do? They don't start with the shading. You know how they start? Big old circles, big old ovals, big old squares. Just the outline, the blocks of the shapes. And then they slowly refine it. They add another layer in Photoshop. They start tracing in the outline of the character. They add another layer. They use finer and finer and finer points to really hone in on the idea until the whole thing comes together. And it sounds like, you know, what Whittler is saying is kind of like what DMTR is saying, where it's like, you know, you can also start in one area, expand out, get that working, expand out, get that working. And I think that's a fair perspective. I think it's, um, you know, it's definitely a very different approach. But like you were saying, Alchemy, you know, it's not a matter of finding the right perspective. It's just a matter of finding a perspective. Right. Yeah. I think, like, it, to put things more simple is... The number one thing that we're looking for if you open your DAW and don't have an idea is a catalyst. And whatever that catalyst might be is, you know, I think what we all search for. Because it's not just a single one, it's one thing that leads eventually to another. Because that's what that's what this is. Every decision, the tune might not be um, sequential, but the decision making is because we have to make one choice at a time. So, you know, whatever we can do to inspire get us inspired or to catalyze ourselves to create a new decision or new idea is ultimately, I think, going to lead us maybe not to a finished tune, but to something more than what you started with. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, kind of with that, <clears throat> I, I, I'm kind of curious. Um, do you, oh, I kind of like, I like literally, I just lost the thing because I just saw, I just saw Purple Pixels saying, put 10 OTTs on the master. <laughs> And now a complete train of thought. What were we talking about? I'm so sorry. Don't do that. Oh, no. Sorry, Alchemy, please repeat your last sentence. I'm so sorry. Um, finding a catalyst to to stimulate our decision making. I completely lost it. <laughs> no, it's okay. I completely lost it. Um, okay, so I guess to just kind of circle back uh, and kind of get to a topic... Um, why don't we 
Oh, that's what it was. I just remembered. And that's, that's what I was going to go. Okay, so with that, would you consider yourself a more reactive artist or a more proactive artist? Because what you're saying is like finding that catalyst sometimes, and, and I'm going to use Mr. Bill again as a reference. I'm, I should just get him on a podcast. Um, but uh, if, he'll, if he'll come on. But um, the a lot of the work that Mr. Bill does is a matter of like, I'm just going to open up Ableton. I'm going to click around. I'm going to hear something. And I'm going to respond to that thing. And then I know a bunch of other people who it's like they have something in here and it's like they hear the chord progression or they hear the bass line or they hear the drum pattern and they get that in and they just sort of follow the ideas through to the conclusion of what they hear in their head. Um, do you find yourselves uh, more in category A or more in category B? I'd say personally, for me, this is like a 50-50 situation. Um, when I hop into the studio, when I start new projects, I um, I go about it like purely reactive. So I do things and I react to it. Um, but then when I bounce out uh, the work in progresses and put them on SoundCloud and listen to them throughout the day, that's when I get like my proactive ideas. And if they're like really solid and I'm like, they're 100% needs to be in the track, um, I'm actually adding them uh, the next day, for example. Um, but after adding those proactive ideas, I'll go back to my uh, reactive producing. And that's just basically a cycle that keeps going on. So it's like a 50-50 situation for me. That's fair. Let's go next. Uh, I'll just go next because mine is simple. Pretty much what DMTR said. Like, I feel like it's, you got to have both, right? Because like, if you're just reactive all the time, you'll delete the same part that you've written three times. Like you can say, oh, well, I want to write a baseline. And like you pointed out earlier, Mr. Bill goes back and deletes the baseline. For me personally, I don't think that's necessarily efficient. Like to go back and keep on just replacing ideas over and over again, like at, there, there's some point where you need to decide that, okay, it is what it is. I need to move on, right? And I feel like when you're too reactive, you're always looking for that next little buzz in your brain because everybody wants to enjoy their track, right? Mm -hmm. And if you keep on searching for it, you won't realize that the idea that you, the, the buzz from the idea that you had before was actually better. It's just that the novelty of the new idea is um, giving you a reaction. See that? see that for sure what do you How, think, all right, if you don't mind me asking um like what are your thoughts on like not having any starting point whatsoever and having to just come up with a sound or, or whatever like what's your what's your approach on that um so my approach on that is if i do that i end up not finding context for everything else Kind of like what I said with the kick drum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take that. And is that something? And sorry, I hope this doesn't feel like a grill. Or I'm genuinely curious. Um, but is that something that, like, have you ever had success out of creating context into that, or do you feel like that's automatically like setting yourself up for failure? Um, in my process, it tends to go too experimental, and it doesn't have enough context. So. It's an interesting like thing to think about with um, understanding and generating a theme, you know, or of uh, understanding or pinpointing what an idea is of a song, you know, and that's kind of like what I think is is a really good. That's kind of where I'm at, anyways. Regarding the question, sorry, I know that was kind of a tangent. To me, I actually feel like there's three different kinds of creativity. Um, there is if you are deducting from something of being critical, so you're kind of like boiling something down where you take something and you add to it and then kind of like the just where does it come from absolutely nowhere and um for me i try to exploit all of those but i can't i have like no i have like no process of like what happens to what it's really just like a spark or spur of the moment sometimes i might be up at like 4 a.m and be like oh i have this great idea maybe not for a song but maybe for just the sound or something and then sometimes like i'll hear you know a loop or a specific random sound that i made and i'm like i hear something with this 
So I think that like just as important as it is for making music, it's also essential to find little things to cultivate your own personal imagination and creativity, kind of like what we were talking about with the sounds that you make and not having any context for it. Um, otherwise, you'll end up like Funkmont and I, where you can't create a context because you don't hear it in anything. No, definitely. I mean, um, <clears throat> that's like, like honestly, it's, it's weird for me because I, I totally see where you're coming from. At the same time, like, I feel like the more I allow myself to let the music come here before it hits the DAW, the harder it is for me to finish the song. Like, I actually find myself trying to push away from being more kind of proactive and sort of just allowing things to come into my head. Um, and like, I notice this especially with like my challenges, um, where if I'm able to sort of execute the entire idea, it's great. But the moment what I hear in my head doesn't one-to-one -one match with what's going on in my DAW, I can't do it. I like literally have to stop working because it's just like this, the cognitive dissonance becomes too strong for me. And I wonder like if I was just sort of reacting to the sounds rather than trying to get like the big chord progression with the strings and the oboes and the trumpets up in here to show up with my shitty fucking contact instruments, like I think I would have been better served because I would have just let the sounds dictate what I was going to write. You know what I mean? Yeah. An old friend of mine called that translation theory of like the inability to always have a one-to-one, -one, you know, of whatever mm. you hear in your head is never going to come out exactly the same. But as it seems like there's always this, this, this dissonance that we all run into from different creative standpoints, but it also kind of like seems to be like a common answer of how do we figure out how to let ourselves go? And what does that mean to let go? You know, cause these are things that like you can bring to attention, but aren't necessarily something that you can, you know, it's, I, I don't think that it's that you can't cultivate it, but I don't think that you can instill that in somebody from like a teaching perspective. You know, it's just, here's an awareness thing. So my, my approach to combat that is actually like taking separate sections, kind of like what you do with challenges of just saying like, this is just an exercise and I'm going to see what I can do with this. And I'm not going to worry about creating a tune because there's a lot to making music other than, you know, like throwing some tracks down, you know, but what happens like if you do those kinds of things or you come up with your own challenges that are more so in means of like, you know, beyond genre, beyond, um, you know, you guys do the picture thing. I love that. I do like, I love to do like soundscaping to that or just anything that has to do with, with sound. Uh, hmm. Definitely. Um, yeah. Did you just want to say something? Um, yeah. I just wanted to, give my take on it. Um, it but the way i look at it is basically um for me personally it's like some kind of conflict between either my ego and on the other side is my actually production knowledge and my production quality um and when i'm making a project um i have had ideas in my head and i'm like questioning myself is my ego um, better than my production knowledge? So is the idea in my head better than everything I could create in the DAW without thinking beforehand? Um, and then I go back to my old music um, and kind of question myself. Um, is it really necessary for me to think about stuff um, before I start producing uh, compared to just doing my thing? And yeah, it's a funny conflict, but um, most of the time my production takes over and I just let the ideas in my head slide away. <laughs> Can I comment on what DMTR said real quick? Please. Okay, so I think one of the things he brought up, like ego, like I don't think a lot of people understand that doing art is a spiritual journey as well mm -hmm. as a yeah. practice. And it, it's, it's good to know that when you're building upon your abilities as an artist, there's going to be things that come up about your ego or your confidence and stuff like that. And I think it's important to recognize that um, that happens to everybody and it's a journey. Oh no. That was pretty you ahead. just have to be kind of honest with yourself. Like when your ego or your ideas in your head don't match with your uh, da, don't always give in to your own ideas and maybe sometimes uh, let your flow or your production take you somewhere else. Um, so yeah, just be honest with yourself and try, try to get better that way. I find, 
um, a lot of times whenever I quit projects, which is pretty frequent, I don't, I stop working on it because kind of like what you said, I know exactly what it is that I want to hear or how I want it to sound. And if it's not that, if it doesn't fit that musical taste, then I'll stop putting the effort into it. Um, which is a good thing because again, it refines that understanding of like what you want to make as far as like who you want to sound like or whatever. But at the same time, um, it is a really jarring and hard to, over, it, it's really big to overcome that and, you know, allow yourself to make something different because we all kind of probably share that fear of like, well, if I start cultivating this in a different way, I don't even like it, whatever. But then it comes down to what your actual goals are. For me, I guess like I'll just sit through and like hammer it out and keep trying to make the same thing until I figure out how to get closer and closer or try to like get it on the technical side of being like, you know, I mean, I you you rated me the other day and I was like, Musar, we're like studying this thing. What do you think? And, you know, all that. Um, it's a it's a psychotic process, but I think that it will pay off eventually. No, absolutely. And I, and I think like it and it gets to, you know all the stuff of like why why we do this like because we all have our own reasons for getting into music and and what inspires us to create and like the ego is a big part of it like i i agree 100 percent with funk mod like i'm not i'm not personally a very religious or spiritual person but i do think that like it is an incredibly intense and personal journey like you gotta like we gotta we gotta be realistic you gotta think you're pretty hot shit to feel like other people should listen to the bullshit you put out <laughs> and like when uh, i was looking at chat and wither was talking about like you know it always feels like the song that he's working on in the moment is his magnum opus it is the song and for me the thing that has actually helped me the most is move away from this idea of whatever song I'm working on is going to be my best song. It's like, no, this is going to be like a pretty mediocre song, but my next song, that's going to be the Beck song. So I got to get this one done so I can get to that next one. And the only reason why I don't put out as much of these tracks is uh, sort of kind of what you were mentioning earlier, um, Alchemy, where it's like, I get to like a 90% mark on a song and I listen to the project and I'm like, this is not me. And that is the biggest thing for me. I feel yeah. like I hit something and I got something good, but it's not me. And getting back to that ego, like I want to write music that someone listens to it and they go, oh, that's a Musar track. That sounds like this person. And I just, I can't, really find a good way to break out of that and that's one of my big struggle points honestly it's a simple process but it's not easy <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of what it comes down to because at the end of the day like we're kind of like fighting ourselves because our artistry that we choose to dislike is different than the artist that we want to be and one thing that we say within a lot of this is the difference between doing and being and so within all that practice, if you want to become something, then you have to invest yourself in it 100 percent, you know, uh, because people can change in that way. Um, how we think, you know, we all have a problem solving way of, of doing things. But whenever you have to shape that, you have to, you know, pretty much embrace that. But one other thing that I wanted to mention with that is, and for all of us is like every single song that's even 90 percent down or like you finish an arrangement is honestly like a miracle. Because if you think about how many decisions have to go into finishing a song from start to finish and how much has to go right in order for you to say, this is a thing, um, literally, you know, and no, I don't mean that in a spiritual way or anything itself, other than the fact that like a lot has to go right in order for it to be done. Um, so within ourselves, one thing that's interesting is like, you know, sorry to kind of go back on that topic is like for you. What are those things as far as where we are in our artistry that do come natural? And is there a way that we can use those those traits or those specific things that come out into um, shifting or, or starting to transition, I suppose, into whatever it is that you want to sound like? Like maybe you can't make a whole tune that's drum and bass that's like, you know, as heavy as you want it to be. But maybe within one of those tunes, you can incorporate maybe one or two of those ideas or maybe just a, a feel or something that slowly begins to mold how you want to, what you want to become. And then over time, like you might end up creating something brand new. No, definitely. Yeah, it, I, I'm 100. I, I, I want to mention something about that, but I, I looked like Funk Mod had something I wanted to say. 
So I want to see. Oh, if you uh, win. <laughs> so um, I'm not exactly how this will. F- I don't know if this is backpedaling or not, but no, no, um, go for it. Um, I feel like a lot of the times that I've noticed just because like I just have a long time that I've been writing music is that even if I'm saying, oh, I don't want to make this certain sound or whatever, and I feel like it's not me, when I when I look back like a few months later, I'm like, oh, it totally makes sense that I was making this dark, like demonic shit. I was fucking angry at the time and my art was trying to tell me that like that I needed to get that out. But I mean, that might be not might not be the same for everybody, but I think maybe just give, giving up and just letting it come out instead of holding back and restricting it and like, you know, trying to get the river to go where you want, where it has some soft soil instead of a hard rock might be a useful technique for some people. No, that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I feel, oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no problem. I just wanted to uh, quickly say that this all like comes down to what Musar said in the beginning like the artists the artists that he looks up to are like the artists that have a strong definition of what they like and what they don't like and like for me personally um 90% of everything i ever made are things that i don't like like but i still made them cuz i have to make something before i can actually uh confirm that i don't like certain things so um yeah that's just how i think about it yeah, I totally agree. I think that there is a language within yourself of, you know, it's one thing to have a discussion right here between a common language. But the thing is, it's like nobody else speaks Musar. Nobody else speaks, you know, Funk Mod or DMTR or myself. And, you know, some people like on silencers, like commenting that he's able to write an emotion. But sometimes like we don't like we might feel a certain way, but we don't know how to write in that particular emotion. Right. So I think that part of the journey is developing that connection with yourself of being able to, you know, say, well, what does sad sound like to me? What does sad sound like to you or to, you know, to all of you guys? Because it might be totally different. Oh, no, 100 um, percent. I mean, I feel like uh, it it's something that comes down to like. The collection of experiences you have and I I talk about this a lot on my stream Um, I have definitely gone on multiple rants that I'm sure some of you have seen of me talking about originality and you know what it means to be a unique person and how much of a bullshit concept that is uh, frankly and like looking at you know my work as like it is a collection of all my influences filtered through the lens that only I can see has helped me immensely. It hasn't gotten me to a place that like, I feel like I can put out multiple tracks in a year, (laughs) but I'm definitely getting to a place where like, I don't have to worry about if it's something that I want to say if I'm just regurgitating what the people I respect say in a sense uh, through my music at least and, and through other things as well. Like, and I, I, I really start to wonder like how much do our influences inform how we can express ourselves in our art? Like, does the fact that I listen to a shit ton of Linkin Park and Asking Alexandria and My Chemical Romance and Under Oath and all these different like post hardcore and metalcore bands, does that mean that whenever I'm trying to write sad, lovey music, I'm ending up writing like angry bass sounds and fucking screaming into a microphone? Maybe. But, you know, it it really changed the way that I look at my art and i'm i'm curious do you think that like you are in any way inhibited or um in any way sort of biased or do you find yourself more open Mm. who goes first anyone bueller Um, bueller uh so for me um 
Alchemy also asked this one time on his stream, uh, like where does inspiration come from? And I told him inspiration comes from a lot of different things uh, for me personally. I have inspiration coming from music. I have inspiration from real life experiences. And for music specifically, um, most of the time, the emotions I uh, I like have when listening to certain tracks kind of reflects what I'm going to make when I'm feeling that certain emotion. So if I'm listening to sad music or dark music when I'm feeling kind of sad for some reason, um, then the sad times will be dark music and emotional music. Um, but on the other side, like my real life experiences also influence that same uh, kind of process. So when I'm feeling sad, but it's like great weather, I'm in a great uh, spot at the moment, I might make uh, kind of uplifting music to other people, but it might actually have more meaning to me, um, like in a sad manner. Uh, so yeah, it's like these different things, but I believe that they, yeah, I'm kind of restricted in a sense. Um, yeah, that's that. my process. Nice. I might be the outlier here by I don't listen to sad music when I'm sad. I listen to happy music when I'm sad. And like when I'm feeling like really like pumped and whatever, I'll listen to the really depressing shit. But I don't know. Maybe I just don't have that language that translates that way. I'm actually, no, I'm actually the same way, honestly. I, I actually can't really write happy music when I'm happy. Like I have to write sad music when I'm happy and I have to write sad music or happy music when I'm sad. Cause it's, it's an, like, and, and I, I want to, I want to get your thoughts on this uh, too, alchemy before I, before I go off on a huge wild tangent, but I, I guess I'm, I just find myself looking at music and artistic expressions. Like I got into art because there's things that I don't know how to say and the art lets me say that. So if I am sad and I want to say I'm sad, like I can't just do that. Otherwise I would be saying, look, I'm fucking sad. <laughs> and as a outlet, I turn to music. So the emotional states are almost always contradictory for me. But uh, give your points on whatever we were talking about before. Don't worry about that. Unless you Can want I to. just appreciate the fact that we're all talking about like making music from ourselves as an artist as opposed to like how do we make bangers and you know get on the radio and, and all that so thank you guys i really appreciate uh the the quality of this conversation um <laughs> in regards to writing an emotion i think that it's like I, I that's it's incredibly difficult for me to write an emotion um other than wanting to have like an overall tone or something but in regards to influence it's kind of like that old you know like uh, pulp fiction thing of like known knowns, known unknowns and unknown unknowns of how you take influence. Um, because something can influence you to do something. Something can also influence you to not do something, you know, or you might hear something and be like, that's not what I want. Or, you know, you develop tastes like that. But from the sheer fact of allowing yourself to intake information and perspective automatically opens you up to, to influence in one way or another. So some people like we were talking about earlier about like people that listen to a lot of other music and stuff or like consume content and stuff. Um, I think that those are people that are, are looking for inspiration and, and influence where some people might be so fixated on a single idea that they need to close that off for everything else. And to what you, you know, what your needs are or what your own personal artistry workflow is, is kind of like open to interpretation, which is also the other cool thing is like DMTR was saying like, he might write a song that might seem happy and stuff, but his own interpretation of it was it's actually like has these really dark underlying themes. And that's like one of the most beautiful things about like writing music that doesn't have a specified message, you know, um, primarily with with lyrics. Right. That's telling you a story as opposed to like how to interpret a story. Although there's that's like, you know, there's a lot of different uh, in betweens there. But yeah, I, I mean, for me personally, I don't even. I don't know. I just opened up my DAW and I'm like, all right, I want to make something that sounds cool. And does this work? <laughs> nope. Screw it. All right. Next one. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, I think it's, uh, it is an interesting thing to look at it from the perspective of us as producers and art for our art form rather than like, 
Um, if we were all painters, would we have a similar perspective? I'm not, I mean, I'm pretty sure we would, because it's not like there's only one style of painting. But, um, <clears throat> like, I do wonder if we were all, say, singers, or if we were all piano players or something. Like, would the things that we express be different? Because, like, we all are into instrumental music, and, like, uh, I actually don't consider myself an exclusively instrumental artist, even though a lot of my songs are instrumental. I do think that, like, I have a story in every song. I have some sort of world, and I use vocals plenty in my music, um, either my own or sampled or whatever, and I have trouble thinking about my music without some sort of vocal message, even if that vocal message is not the story of the song, without that, I feel like I can't communicate as much. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, do y'all feel like you have no problem with that? Do you feel like it's actually harder to write with words, so to speak? It For depends me. on the context. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Go ahead, Alchemy. Go ahead. Go first. I, I think it depends on the context and what that story is and how aware of what it is that you're trying to communicate is, you know, because sometimes you might have a message between a piece of sound instead that is a clear message but just is in your own language so like that's part of the reason why i like aggressive basses and all that and why we all like that stuff it's because it allows you to project anger or project you know a lot of frustration or anything that you want to say in a loud way but in a way that's more appealing and acceptable to a larger audience you know and it's kind of interesting of like over time how much more we tend to have an affinity. I'll speak for myself, how much more I have an affinity over like vocal basses as opposed to just something that's like screechy or whatever, because that in a sense does have its own personification in some in my own language or, or whatever, you know? And I think that provides value. But likewise, you can still say the same thing in a much more clear sense of like, you know, I don't want to say anything bad, but of whatever it is that you're trying to convey. Totally. What did you want to say, DMTR? Um I would say, like, for me personally, writing with words would be an extremely hard task for me. Because um, even when I listen to lyrical music, I don't listen actively to the words. So my favorite singers and artists, I like them because of, uh, first of all, the melody lines, their timbre of the voice. Um, and it's not really about the lyrics for me. So uh, when I would... Uh, write music with words that would be extremely hard because I have no experience whatsoever with putting like lyrical um, yeah, meaning to my tracks, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of so, sense, yeah. honestly. What do you think, Funk Mod? Uh, <laughs> 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 I don't know. I'm not, I'm not opposed to vocals, but I just, I don't know. For me, they just are another instrument. Like, if they say something, that's cool. Like, I honestly could, if it, if a vocal hook sounded cool in Japanese and I had no idea what it said, but it fit the song, I'd totally use it. I don't really care. Yeah. So I respect that. The, the tone color more than the uh, the actual messaging. Yeah, like the hookiness of it, basically. I don't know. I think the reality of, of it is because we are creatures of communication and the voice is like one of our most natural things that we're, that we have affinity to beyond just words. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, like we have like a specific ear that we hear to for babies crying and all that stuff. Right. Um, so somebody, um, <laughs> but we naturally have like, um, yeah, an affinity towards the human voice. And so, you know, there are so many characterizations or so many archetypes that a vocal can fill. It can be an effect. It can be, you know, it can have a tone. It can have a straight up message within a specific language. It can have a melody line. It can have, it can do so much. And I think that's why, uh, kind of like what Whittler was saying, why it is so much easier to do. You can easily take that and turn it into a pad, but we naturally have this likeness usually towards it because, um, because it is somebody speaking. And I'm not going to say like everybody likes you know, words or everybody likes choir or whatever, um, but it is familiar. And I think that's one of the biggest things to kind of take note of. 
Definitely. Well, it gets back to, you know, influences, whether sought or unsought. Like, you know, I am not going to say that I particularly wanted to listen to NSYNC and Backstreet Boys, but I have an older sister and a younger sister. And uh, now I have a lot of R&B chords and drum grooves just drilled into my head. And it definitely comes through in my music. Um, so being able, I think, to sort of acknowledge that just because something is familiar that makes it more acceptable is kind of a fun thing because it like it makes a lot of the guesswork sometimes go away. I was going to say, too, like imagine if and this could be for anybody, but like imagine if you, you know, took a bass line and you wrapped something out to it. Right. Um boom boom you're a fucking bitch. you know something like that sorry not any to anybody but <laughs> you take that rhythm and you make a bass out of it and that's what you're saying but you personify that within a different sound um because that's you know like that's something that is familiar to us you can't come up with a bass line then just rap one out or like sing one out or whatever and i think that's like one of those things that a lot of people actually do like subconsciously <laughs> i'm sorry it's just an idea it's okay <laughs> uh, no, actually, I think that's a good point. Like, because I, I, I'm wondering, like, how often do all of you end up beatboxing or vocalizing out your ideas before you write them? Kind of the, the Timbaland style of producing, so to speak. Because I, I know that these vocal chords are a big part of my production process. And you'll hear me making noises. This is actually one of the reasons why I don't produce on stream. Because if you watch me during a challenge, I will just make sounds. <laughs> I will just randomly vocalize noises, and I can't help it. And it feels kind of embarrassing at times, but like I think it it does it pulls you physically into the song that you're writing in a way that like just sort of intellectualizing it. I talk a bunch uh, about like intellectualizing music versus like experiencing music, and like experiencing it always feels more comfortable for me but I don't know if that's a consistent thing for other, for other people. Yeah, absolutely. I think something that's really like amazing or exciting about it too, is that like when you start to consider the physical factors that we run into with things, like let's say you, to me, it's all about building awareness, right? Cause like, let's say I beatbox something, right? Like I'm going to make a halftime too, you know, like, the, you know, or something of that nature. We still have to breathe in between. And when you become more aware of those things and you're able to incorporate that uh, as a translation, device you know then i think that's something that is a lot more helpful um whittler was saying that uh he does it in his head but i think that like <laughs> stop sam <laughs> but, um, but you know if you can kind of conceptualize you know rhythms and music in that way then i think that's a great way to write bass music you know um or well any kind of music that you want to write i guess i i tend to be more of like that's why glitch stuff is so super, is like super fun, you know, especially when you get all technical with the little intricacies of those things and you kind of have an imagination from that. But that's all it is, man. Like, uh, I think like assimilation, you know, if you can use things to assimilate or assimilate with whatever it is that you're trying to achieve or whatever, you know, steal it, draw ideas. 100%. Um, either one of you want to add in? No. Yeah, for me personally, it's beatboxing and doing the weird sound stuff like Alchemy is doing right now. It's something I do like in the everyday life. So <laughs> when I'm doing other activities, um, I'll I might find myself some <laughs> oh boy, all the time. Um, I might find myself beatboxing, but it's not uh, really that I try to actually use them in the studio. It's just like a gateway for inspiration and things I'm experiencing at the moment, and I'm. Yeah, because I'm, I have been a dancer uh, throughout my life, so I've uh, done break dance, popping and locking, um, and every time when I was dancing, I find myself beatboxing my own beats. So I was actually making the beats to my own dance uh, freestyles, um, which is uh, pretty weird for other people, but to me, it's like it enhances my experience of yeah being in that uh, groove or in that flow. Can you talk um, for us? I, what do you know tutting tutting, tutting. a little bit but a little yeah stuff. like yeah 
There we go. <laughs> Great 20 frames per second. <laughs> Easy. Perfect. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Um, but yeah, it's not like I'm actively using it. It's just more of like an outlet for my experiences and my inspiration. <laughs> oh boy, Winder. <laughs> All right. Uh, Goodness. It looked like you wanted to comment on that alchemy. Did you have something you wanted to say? Or I I'm just admiring the chat, that's okay. all. <laughs> Alright, well Funk Mod, what do you what do you think? Uh yeah, I don't beatbox or anything. <laughs> I just uh I have I have two two methods. This is how I know if the if it's going right. If I go like this, gun fingers, or my head starts knocking, or I just start acting like I'm like like a very eccentric composer not composer uh conductor. what do they call those they do with the stick conductor, conductor yeah. yeah if i feel like i can conduct my wubs <laughs> that's fair that's fair i dig that but i i do use my vocals for if i'm doing a melody sometimes i'll whistle it to kind of try to figure out what the next logical note is but that's about it i dig that i dig that um all right uh, I'm trying to think of like any other topics. Are there any other topics from chat? Because I'm, I'm starting to reach the point where I can't think of good conversation starters. Uh, actually, I guess while we're waiting for topics from chat, if anyone wants to throw in any things, I guess we could do a little bit of a, a fun, you know, making bangers topic. I know Alchemy was excited that we were all talking about philosophy stuff. We're like, oh, we're such creative artists. Um, I want to ask. What is your desert island synth? It can't be a stock synth. It has to be a third-party VST. But what is your desert island synthesizer? Like if I had no first-party, like only one synthesizer? Yeah. Like you can't use any you, – you can use your DAW. You can use all the stock effects and stuff. But you only get one synthesizer, and it has to be a third-party one. I'm looking at DMCR like, oh, no. <laughs> Because like fucked. all of this stuff is first party. Um, no, that's why it's a good challenge. Come on, face plant, man, easily. Face good plant. answer. Good answer. What about you, DMCR? I guess I would say the same thing. Because <laughs> like operator is my only synth I actually use. So um, I guess face plant and just try to learn it. Um, or FM8. FM8 go. is something um, I might use as well, or learn more in that. Yeah. What about you, Funk Mod? Well, if you type the command in the chat, Musar is a phase plan affiliate, and I would also recommend that you get phase plan from Kilohertz. Exclamation mark KHS, exclamation mark KHS in chat, exclamation mark KHS in chat. No, I but like on the real, it's just like it's like it's like serum, but more oscillators. No, honestly, uh, yeah pretty sweet <laughs> <laughs> i like kilohertz hey kilohertz kilohertz pair pair and and anders you three you better be watching this because i'm plugging the shit out of your stuff okay anyways <laughs> can we can we actually like talk about some sound design stuff before yeah, we no, head out i wanted to uh, yeah i wanted to yeah yeah I, I mean um yeah i mean in regards to phase plan i could probably give an entire spiel on on why that's great but um but just in general um i'm i'm kind of curious as to like if you guys are experimenting with sound design or like what, what are your, I guess, uh, what are you guys exploring right now within your own personal like projects and stuff? For sure. I'll go, I'll go last cause I'm the host. So since you asked the question, why don't you start us off? For me yeah. personally. So I'm doing a couple of things right now. Um, one thing that I'm really in the, Mud pies are great. Um, one thing that I'm really in the midst of is creating heavy and industrial drums uh, by processing Foley. So if you send that through some heavy distortion and then also a vocoder and you tame the transients of it, then you end up getting these like really like deep oil drum sounding percussive effects that you can use to create your own mud pies and uh, you know just kind of use to create your own grooves. But the cool thing about it too is that I have it sent through an arpeggiator, so it's already taking care of some of the groove ideas for me. So it's giving me immediate inspiration as opposed to like one sound, you know? No, definitely. I, I honestly, I should try that more. I don't, I don't use enough fully in my in my music these days. Uh, what about you, Funk Mod? Um, 
one of the things I've been doing lately, just like with faceplant and stuff, is using the multipass a lot. Like mm -hmm. just doing a lot of um, frequency dependent um, processing. And then also one thing I've been also doing is um, before I was using a lot of closed off filters, I've been leaving the filters a little bit more open to get more harmonics to mess with, especially when you're doing like the multiband stuff, because you can always take it out later just for like movement or groove or whatever. But I found that starting off almost more noisy and then subtracting tends to work better, especially for like neuro stuff. Um, I agree. Whereas like if you want more like deep sounds, it tends to be more of a um, uh, filter than subtractive, processing. subtractive as opposed to um, building up like a ton mm -hmm. of movement and then using that to um, keep it more interesting, I guess. Totally, totally. Um, so real quick, uh, before DMTR goes, so Russell Constables, uh, Mud Pies is just a thing that like Mr. Bill came up with to talk about like you have a sound design thing that you're working with and then you just record that into another thing and you're starting to modulate the parameters. Like you have like a synth patch that you're playing and then you just record yourself tweaking the synth patch and like moving different LFOs and like applying different effects and just searching through that just 10 or 20 minute file of audio to find sounds. That's that's usually the mud pie process. Do you wanna say something, um, Alchemy? Sorry, in regards to that, for all of you guys that end up doing mud pies, um, I just realized that I was getting ready to cut DMCR off, so I'm sorry. Um, but just as a quick note, whenever you guys make stuff, one tip that I think would be really useful for you guys is to not try to apply it directly into your sound. Use that as a means of a starting point and continue to process that. Um, even further as far as like your mixing and stuff goes, because a lot of times you'll get cool like phrases, but it won't be usable because of the way that you're changing the actual sound and changing the actual levels and doing all different kinds of things. Like you're most of the time, that's why people compress so much is because you have all these changes in amplitude. And so in order to get something consistent, you squash everything down to a similar level and that's what makes it a little bit more usable. Um, just something to think about. Definitely. Quick question for you guys on that topic. Um, do you generally have a beat behind while you're doing your mud pies or do you just do it where it's just solo the sound? Solo. Solo? Yeah. Yeah, yeah always. Um, um, I try to look for, for ch big changes in phrases. And um, sometimes it might be set up to an LFO that's on the same speed. Uh, not always, but if you do that, um, that's why I am such a big proponent of Portal is because whenever it gives you your glitch cuts and stuff, it's always in time. Or you can set it to always be in time, but also have free tuning as well. But it makes it a lot easier to hear in a context as opposed to trying to resize something in the means of a beat. Um, you can kind of just place that in and then actually process the sound as opposed to playing with the timing of it. Oh, for sure. For sure. That makes sense, actually. Uh, what about you, DMTR? What's your your secret sauce right now? Just, just operator? Um, <laughs> um, right now, it's actually um, making... Uh, granular or like Reese or neuro basis. So uh, specifically uh, making my uh, normal uh, operator sounds, but uh, actually putting them through granulator and uh, using the scan function um, to create uh, movement throughout the uh, like giant recordings I'm making. Because um, back in the day, I used granulator more as like a static uh, thing where I kept looping the grain. Uh, every time, and I just uh, change the file position. But right now, I'm trying to actively use uh, the scan function that it actually keeps moving throughout the whole sample instead of just uh, looping one specific point. And I'm trying to incorporate that, that in my sound design at the moment. Yeah, that's really fun. I don't I don't put bases enough into granular things, and you can get some really cool textures out of that. Um, yeah, for me, like. Honestly, my big thing over the past, I'd say, six months has been essentially removing myself as a creator of sounds and more into a position of curating sounds. Um, and, and just what I mean by that is <clears throat> a lot of my sound design these days involves doing the same sort of sound design that I normally would do, but 
I remove anything that's consistent, like an LFO or an envelope or automation, and I exclusively use sample and hold and randomness. Exclusively. And then I just generate like these huge long mud pies like you are, and I try to make as much of my process about that. And I try to just like, what can I make random in this? And I've been playing around with like, randomizing you know different filters randomizing different effects like if you just throw a bunch of random modulators onto like a bit crusher you can get some crazy tones and uh another quick plug for killer stuff if you like killer stuff you should check how they have a little drop down arrow on their plugins and there's a little uh dice icon and you press the dice icon and it actually randomizes every single parameter on that fucking effect so you can randomize so much stuff and just get some results. Like Whittler, honestly, Whittler's like random uh, massive riser thing was like such a eye-opening experience for me that now I, like, I just want everything to have a random button. I want everything to have a random button now. Um, That's one of the most beautiful things about Faceplant. And honestly, why um, I get a lot of questions about why I've been doing more stuff in Bitwig, but... That's honestly it, is because there's so many more modulators and creative things to let everything just fly off and push record and see what you get. And it's very rewarding when it becomes usable. Sometimes you end up feeling like you're wasting your time, but when you you know, set up a bunch of random things and you just hit play and you're like, dang, that's really cool. Dang, that's really cool. And you start getting ideas for it. I think that it's really satisfying. And Funkmon and I were talking earlier. He was like, yeah, I'd rather just like let the computer do the work for me. And it's like, why not? Like Some people have a have a workflow of like they hear a bass sound and they want to automate it exactly and be super precise with it and i think that those people that have the patience to do it like more power to you um i don't so i'd much rather you know leave it up and try to find some kind of inspiration through that means as opposed to you know just sitting on a sync parameter trying to you know get that that filter movement just the right way oh no 100 percent. i actually have a workflow tip can like related to uh, mud pies so i know a lot of people take separate sessions to do mud pies but one of the things i've been doing lately in my workflow is once i have the base like 32 bars or something where i'm like oh yeah this groove's nice like it just i just it just needs a little spice a little something what i'll do is i'll export all the bass from that tune and then make a mud pie out of that and then all all the time i'm doing processing and editing i'll do like four different ones or something so i have some options and just grooving along to it finding the spot where it needs something and then just scanning through and they seem to all kind of have fit a little bit because they're from the same source material without sounding a little random sound you know so to clarify are you saying that you create a baseline out of the mud pie and then resample that and then look for different chops uh no so i'll have Sorry. a pretty static baseline and then I will take that if I'm like, oh, I have no idea what to put in here, but it needs a little bit of like a little bit of sparkle here and there. Uh, what I'll do is take that entire file and then use that as a mud pipe, put it through a sampler, have random start positions and everything really right. weird processing and stuff. Makes sense. I mean, it's, well, it's like the, it's just it's curation. And that's that's the thing that I feel is almost um, <clears throat> like for me, at least a big change in how I look at music in the past is like, you know, a lot of times I think about, you know, the earliest music as essentially imitation of sounds early humans heard in the world. We were hearing birds chirp and we figured if we hollowed out this bone and we blew into all these little holes, it would sound kind of like the bird. And over time, all the stuff that we're doing is, in some ways, an attempt to try and mimic something we heard before while also like pushing into some new territory. It's like this weird contradiction, you know what I mean? And yeah. like, I have really started to look at the act of composing as strictly curation. You're just taking these sounds that you've collected either in your head or in your DAW and you put them together in some way and it almost like it makes it more relaxing to produce because you don't have to like it divorces you from this idea of I have to make something instead of making something you're just picking something out and putting it into place 
And that kind of coincides with the whole thing that I was talking about with developing imagination, because that in its own right is an exercise, right? Of Okay, now I have this and I don't really hear anything. Well, let's just take some of this and put it together and see what ends up coming out of it, you know? And then once you kind of have that idea, then you can kind of start to um, develop more of, you know, more of a defined thing. And the other thing to think about too is like, let's say you make all these like crazy bases because that's usually the most common thing with mud pies. Well, maybe the the natural character of it fits, but the sub doesn't work. Well, you can always take that out and replace that with a regular sub or with, you know, a different call and response with that. And then you start problem solving and coming up with more creative ideas in order to make that work within your tune. And I think that's like kind of like where a lot of us are with understanding how to actually implement the idea of the mud pie within our own tracks. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. I'm just trying to look to see if I, I missed a couple of questions. Um, does anyone else have anything they want to add onto this topic or? Bueller? <laughs> Bueller? Okay. Uh, well, yeah, well, let's just, let's, because I think now is a good time to start moving towards uh, the, the final couple sections here. So I'm just going to rattle off a couple of questions that I see in chat um, and <clears throat> go in from there so silencer sam wants to know how did everyone get their name so i feel like dmtr is technically the easiest one because he explained it at the for beginning sure. so if you want to if you want to just reiterate that for silencer sam um yeah it's just basically my real name dimitri without um yeah all my eyes in there all the so vowels dmtr <laughs> yeah that's it so it's basically just my own name Alchemy. I originally started off as Aeon, and um, I had a I had a collective release as far as like a tricking thing where everybody puts the music out, and I had issues getting onto Spotify, so I ended up changing it to Alchemy. But they all they both kind of represent a similar theme of just for one the type of sound and the type of atmosphere or thing that you think about. But also I, I kind of like the idea of manipulation of taking a bunch of crap and figuring out how to make something out of it. I dig it. That's sick. Mukmon? All right. Mine's bad. <laughs> uh, so when I started DJing like 12 or 13 years ago, um, I wanted to do like, because like the music scene in my area had like no bass music. It was all house music or trance. Like not a single drum and bass or a dubstep night, or it, there was a little bit of a breaks kind of thing going on, but that died off before I even could attend events. So um, I wanted to start my own radio station. <laughs> so FM, oh. <laughs> and, then, and then I just came up with acronyms for that. And also I, I like the one of my first, I would say, natural psychedelic moments with music was hearing a james brown break so that's like funk you know and then that kind of influenced the rest of my um musical upbringing so nice that's sick what about you musar where did your name come from okay well it's stupid um but uh if i go ahead and i open up a new window here for everyone to see and i just type in my name without the music in there you get this little wikipedia article so uh, Musar is a Hebrew word that talks about um, like it's a it's a movement. Um, it's a concept that talks about like ethical and moral study, like kind of becoming a better person through learning like the actual word um, Musar means uh, like <clears throat> ethical study or ethical enlightenment and um, at that point in my life, I was just, you know, I was trying to figure out what I was going to be. Like, I had gotten into music. Um, I had a really shitty, stupid name that I'm, that no, you're not, no one's learning that ever. You're never finding my other alias, ever. You're never finding it. But, um, uh, we'll see after a few beers. <laughs> we'll see. Yes. After a few <laughs> beers, you might find out about the alias. But, um, I would say, um, like I was in a place where I found myself searching for knowledge. And for me, music is like entirely an educational pursuit. I am inspired when I'm learning something. If I am 
growing in my knowledge, in my experience, then I am doing what I want to do with music. And so I was just looking for things that connected with that, that connected with my, you know, cultural background, being Jewish. And I just found Musar as a word that spoke to me. And I was like, you know what? There are no other musicians named Musar. Why don't I try and have an original name? <laughs> and I just went with that. That's, that's a lot. There's a lot behind that. And there's a lot of things to build your music off of uh, when you start to look back at it out of your history, you know, and create your legacy. Yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> I don't I I don't know. I don't try and think too deep about it. I just I don't know. It I, like, I don't know. is a cool name. I mean, but what yeah. about Techno Kid 420? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's the side alias. That's my techno alias. But um no, I mean, I don't know. Like I have always felt that and maybe I don't know. Have if y'all felt this uh way, but like I've always found names for things, whether it's like my artist name or whether it's like my uh my song titles like i don't think of song names the song names kind of reveal themselves to me just like my artist name it revealed itself to me i was looking for things and the word came up and that kind of naturally came in i can't really i don't know i feel weird acting like it's some big deep spiritual thing when i was just like it it fit mm -hmm. It's only as much power as you give it, but it definitely came from somewhere. And I think that alone is, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, a name is just a name. It's just something to relate to. But sometimes, you know, there's there's a lot of different hats that we wear. Sometimes you are selling yourself as an artist. Sometimes you're selling yourself as a persona. Sometimes you're portraying yourself as whatever it is that you want to be. And something that I think is kind of fun um, and which kind of leads into another question of like, you don't have to like link it or, or tell me, but something that I would like all of us to think about is like, if you had one song to share with somebody that represents your artistry uh, that you made, like what would that be that defines you or at least at that time? Yeah, I think that's, that's a tough one. Oh, that's a tough one. I'm not gonna answer that question, but oh, we lost DMTR. Bathroom break. Oh, oh, oh I missed that, sorry. Um, all right, well, I guess while we're waiting, I have another question. I, I really want to get to this question from Hexic because I thought it was a really, really good one. Um, is trying too hard to refine a process, no matter what that might be, damaging? Like, does it do more harm than good? Can you give an example? Yeah, well, I'm, Hexic would probably have Hexic. to. But, yeah. I'm, but my, my assumption... Uh, if I had to try and extrapolate is like, you know, uh, can you overwork a sound or can you overwork an, um, you know, a song or can you overwork your understanding of something? I guess for me, it sounds kind of like the question, like, can learning music theory restrict your creative abilities? And for me, it's a very like subjective thing. Like, if you are not approaching music theory as a form of knowledge and learn, looking at it as a form of rules, then yeah. Um, just like if you're looking at, you know, the time I put into this music or to this bass sound, um, <clears throat> you know, does that actually connect with what it is that I'm doing? Does it actually, um, you know, connect with what my goals are? Am I using it as a crutch or am I using it as a tool, essentially? And that's the way that I look at it. Oh, here's, here's right, I can response. go on this. Yeah, go uh, for it. So I'm obsessive with process. Um, I, I it, It's had good results, at least... I think so. <laughs> but um, for me, the goal of process is to make it so you don't, so your translation of idea to what it comes out to be, there's as little delay as possible. So like, I know you guys have probably experienced this where you write a song and you, the first idea that you had suddenly morphs into something else, which is, which is fine, but it's still frustrating, right? So I think getting a flow of the process makes it so it's automatic 
and you you make the idea you, you you're not doing the work anymore that that work is automatized through your process you are the one that is making the idea and like for me personally i why i'm so obsessed with process and efficiency is because i i think it's funner to be in flow on a song and when you're flowing it just it's more entertaining and it, you want to come back to it because you have this great feeling of going through your process that like by the end of it you're confident that it's going to be something that the initial idea you had or it's going to be like oh wow i surprised myself on that one because all of the technical stuff is automated i think it's a good point actually mm -hmm. i didn't even think about that um so i actually have a couple of things written down um that kind of correlate with this i was telling you that i wrote this down in 2018 on your stream earlier about like just different things about like workflow and stuff but mm -hmm. um to me my own personal thing that I found is to answer the question simply, absolutely, you can totally overdo something and you can totally miss out. But the thing is that there's only so many angles that you can see at one point in time. You know, your peripheral vision only expands so far. So for me, I've kind of divided song creation or me being an artist into five different parts of finding my why, finding my what, my how, and then recreating the process. And then on my board, you can't see it, but um, back when I took privates with Copycat, one thing that we came up with together with like, you know, a, a means of workflow is establishing a structure and, you know, use the structure as long as you enjoy it. And when it stops working, like take one element and create a new structure out of it. So you're in this constant means of like shedding, so to speak, you know, if something continues to work, you know, ride that energy. And if it doesn't, then, you know, be open to changing those ideas as opposed to, you know, trying to beat a dead horse. But there's there's so many ways to, from a song to go from beginning to end and, um, you know, finding what works for you. It's important to do that, but it's also important to understand that it's not always going to, like, work out the same way. There is a refinement process, and I do think that you can get better at it. But, um, you know, there's, it, there's not really a right or wrong within this, and it's important to, like, always let that be known. No, 100%. Um, so, DMTR, just to kind of fill you in while you were out in the restroom we were just answering one of hexic's questions about um is refining a process quote unquote too much potentially damaging or can you refine a process too much so that it becomes damaging the process and he gave a little uh, clarification uh in chat i don't know if you saw that um but i'm just wondering what your what your thoughts are on that like do you think you could like <clears throat> make the songwriting process too streamlined essentially where it's like you remove the joy from it or whatever um as far as my personal uh yeah music endeavors have been i haven't been in that situation where i haven't had fun making music um so i don't know personally um when that might happen um but i do can imagine in some way when you're making it too technical and you're like overthinking things um, that might induce some kind of stress uh, to you um, mentally or actually in your body. Um, and that might like take the fun away from the process. But yeah, that's just what I think would happen. Oh yeah, I get that. I get that. I mean, I, I, I feel like I'm kind of similar to Funk Mod in that I feel as though like, you know, once you know how you can make music that's good, like that you like, there isn't really a way to overwork that process because all you're doing is refining what it is that you want to do. Um, <clears throat> and I, I honestly, like, I find myself at my best when I'm in kind of like this state between being comfortable and being uncomfortable where like i know i can accomplish the task but it's hard it's work it's effort i have to push and i have to do things in order to get the result um and it's it's like that learning flow state essentially where you're you're treading that line between oh I don't know if this is it but I'm doing well oop I'm doing well and you just kind of coast that kind of wave on the way up mm -hmm. and along that journey I think it's easy to get caught up in refining the wrong thing 
which I think is what Hexic is concerned about, um, mm-hmm. which is more like wasting effort on something that isn't what you want rather than refining the thing that's good. And I think if you're in a position where like Funk Mod is, you know, there isn't a bad place to stop on uh, refining. It's just you you keep going. Um, yeah, and, and at just, that point. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. Uh, There's timing issues. Don't swear at Alchemy. Don't sweat it. Go ahead, DJ. Um, um, but for me personally, like, like I said, the refinement thing hasn't been much of a problem for me. Uh, simply because I always tried to refine a certain process uh, for myself. Um, but right now, I like don't have a process. Like There are things that I do the same every time, maybe, but I don't have a strict process of how I do things. Every project is completely different in a completely different way. I start with different things, do sound design differently, and... Yeah, so I'm just literally a blank space and exploring. And I don't really think too much into it. So, yeah. No, definitely, definitely. Um, anyone have any final thoughts? Or I have a, there's another question from Justin I kind of want to get to, but uh, last. Yeah, can I comment on the refining aspect of yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Please, please. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't be too afraid of refining the wrong thing because that might actually be useful later on. Like, there was a point where I was really obsessive about, like, drum processing. And I would spend way too long to the point where the drums were the main focus of the tune. And then the bass line, I could never fit a bass line in, right? And so it's good to have all that knowledge. I just decided, oh, cut back a little bit on this. Or I'm going to get overwhelmed by not being able to catch up to the quality or... Well, not even quality, just the style I want to go for. Um, and I, I think that it comes through through your music to have that, that advantage, to have these specialties that you didn't necessarily think through that you wanted to gain, mm-hmm. but they can be really useful afterwards. Like for me, I used to be really obsessive about mixing and mastering, and now that I now that I know all about it, like I can be really minimal about it, and it speeds up my workflow a ton. Oh yeah, and what Whittler is saying, I think, is is actually an interesting addendum. Like, you know, there maybe isn't a problem with refining too much, but there is definitely a problem with just like keeping track of everything. Because it's like I'm not one of those people who believes there's like a finite amount of space in your head. I don't believe that. I think you can contain a shit ton of stuff up here, but the ability to access it is really the struggle point, and making sure that you are like refining or maybe not refining but at least uh focusing on the things that you need to know in that moment other rather than trying to just get everything in um, kind of prioritizing your information i think that like especially in regards to sound design or creation in general um it's always important to like for me i don't actually use the word technique um, because I think that technique means that it's one way to solve one problem, um, whereas a skill is meant for an open end. And um, for any of you guys that have been around me whenever I teach sound design stuff, I'm more so about uh, teaching mechanics of things and more so about understanding what the essence of the tools that you're using are. So that way, it's a lot easier for you to get back to some of those things that you may or may not quote unquote unforget. forget. Um, how many different ways can you use a compressor? You know, um, and when you understand that in such a way, then it's not even so much as like I'm making this sound and I'm only copying the sound design recipe. It's being able to critically listen to whatever it is that you're trying to create and say, OK, well, I know the tools that I need to recreate this movement or to recreate this timbre. Oh, definitely. I think like what you're pointing at is like you want it to be something that you like it's intuition rather than like than just like, oh, I need to compress this to more dB. It's like, oh, this needs to be more squashed, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think like confidence in your tools will allow you to make those to make those choices 
you know, because you'll be able to uh, just kind of get a feel for it over time. And I think that like, that's why it's important to compare to your own or reference your own music too, of being like, well, the last time I made this main section, like the bass wasn't enough. So maybe during this process, if I try to, you know, push the limiter a little bit louder or, you know, however you want to cut the cookie, it will allow you to basically refine in that own sense, because kind of like tying everything up together, it all comes from, you know, from experience and this is how to draw upon that past experience in order to push your own expertise further i think it's actually a really good point um <clears throat> now um, oh. uh real quick i do want to touch on the thing that justin was talking about um and he's asking some questions about like the dead mouse master class and emotions and, and like how dead mouse doesn't really focus on like other people's emotional context. Um, but I do, I guess kind of want to change that question a little bit, Justin and, and focus it in on to like, um, like what would you say your goals are in music? What do you say? What would you say you you want to do with either your career or your art or whatever? Like I've I've talked about, like um, for me, music is is big on like learning. Like that's my goal. That's one of the reasons why I do streaming. Why I like being educational. Why like I pick Musar as the fucking name is because I like learning. And music is all about learning. My art is all about having a growth of knowledge. Um, so do you find yourselves with like some specific goal in mind and, and what would that be? Um, for me personally, in essence, um, I started producing um, to kind of process everything, every experience, every emotion I have on a daily basis. Um, and it's like external processing for me. So instead I have to do it in my head, I can do it in my DAW um, and it helps me cope and just do uh, regular stuff so that's um, essentially what I um, uh, want for my own music um, and towards other people I want to have like an outlet of music that has like the same effect on them so they are able to listen to my music and feel their emotions and try to process them uh, by listening to my music and in that way have the same experience as me creating the track um, instead, they're just listening to it. Nice. Um, so yeah, that's my goal. Like that. Who wants to go next? Go for it, Funk. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay, so I'll definitely have to separate career and music on this one. Um, artistically speaking, for the music, uh, for me, my ultimate goal is to be able to write music every single day and now tying into the career thing, I want my career to facilitate it so I can sit here and not worry about other things other than just making music. Like I just wanna like I just wanna paint and make music, like at the end of the day. But um like my, my vision for my music specifically is I want to take the 140 format and I want to introduce all the things I love about neurofunk, tech step, dark drum and bass into dubstep. So dig it nice yeah that's cool um i think that you're doing a pretty good job already 100 percent. i appreciate but, it man. Thank you. but definitely yeah i agree Neuro Pump. Neuro Neuro Pump. do it you got the no. new alias i think with my own music there's a lot of things to consider um for one i think that we can all agree that it's a universal language and it's the one thing that we can communicate with each other without having to express words that is a little bit easier to interpret so for me i really am in the pursuit uh pursuit of um creative freedom and being able to tell stories and uh share the experiences that i've had throughout my life in terms of non <laughs> um non vocal means um but, you know, the byproducts of that is I also see that there could potentially sometime down the road be a means of uh, of a career of some sort. I don't necessarily even care what it is as long as I enjoy it. And um, and then also, like, I try to mention this as much as possible, but the community that is the ultimate byproduct of this 
you know i mean how many of us have like not trying to be like sentimental or anything but how many of us have like felt misunderstood in our lives and we turn to music to try to find that connection with each other and in this in this way in a lot of ways i think that we all kind of found each other in order to share that you know regardless of if we like each other's music or not we're all on the same path together and to me like i find peace within that oh yeah i mean making music is one of the few global communities that exists like uh, I remember <clears throat> I was watching an Adam Neely video uh, a couple months ago, and he was talking about how he went on a tour of, I want to say it was um, either uh, Mongolia or India or something, and he was talking about how, like, he did a couple of, like, recording sessions with artists, and, like, they couldn't necessarily communicate with words, but they all play music. They all understand rhythm. They all understand yeah. the same basics of harmony, the same basics of melody, even if the systems are different, even if they approach it from different ways. We all know. Like we all can feel that groove no matter what language we speak. And having that access, I think is, it's a really important thing. And like having this community on Twitch is like, I think a microcosm of that, honestly. Yeah. Like we all you, come together. If you think about it, um, as far as biologically, all of our senses in one way or another are a different language. So our sight is a language, our sense of feel, our sense of taste, our sense of smell, all that stuff. And I think for us, we've kind of just maybe figured out what our favorite, you know, language is to, in order to communicate with each other. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know. I don't want to, like you said, I don't want to get too sentimental. But I do appreciate uh, kind of the, the the family we've built. I keep coming back to that, but like I, I really do feel like on Twitch, we've built a family of people who like. You got people making you know noise based music. We got people making neurofunk. We got people making deep dubstep. We got people making you know electro house. We got people making trance. We got people making break core. We got so many different people who like even if we don't necessarily like you're saying like the music of all the other artists, like we all respect each other and we all are pushing each other to grow and to continue to evolve uh, as artists and as people. And I'm, I'm for one, like super, super grateful. Uh, like everyone watching right now, the three of you, like thank you all so much again for, for doing this. Let's get some, here we go. Let's get some little hand hearts. <laughs> Uh, but I, I think that's, that's a really good point, honestly. Um, and honestly, I, I do like, I would like to keep going, but I also think that that's like the most poetic place to end <laughs> the topic. Uh, yep. so I think, I think now, uh, is a good point to start wrapping things up. So why don't we go through everyone, uh, shut yourselves out one last time, talk about your socials, talk about your, uh, plans, what you got going on. Let's start with Funk Mod. All right. Uh, you can find me at Funk Mod on SoundCloud. Um, I don't know. All the other stuff's kind of like you guys are mostly producers. So that's probably the best way to support me. Um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. That's for normies. <laughs> but. Um, uh, as far as like releases and stuff, um, hopefully after the quarantine is over, I can start playing some more gigs. That would be awesome. Uh, get some stuff rescheduled and stuff like that. Um, I have two EPs confirmed for this year. So first EP is going to be out on Abysmal Entities, uh, my friend Durandal's and Chance's label. Um, going to have a collab EP with Durandal, um, two collabs and then two singles from each one of us um, on Defy Culture. Um, that's Tennessee label run by Chief Kaya and I think a few other people. And then um, just continue the series of free EPs I've been doing. Um, got uh, Layer 004 was last year. I'm gonna do another free EP this year, uh, four tracks, uh, totally free. So if you wanna support that, that'd be awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Also, thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. We're gonna we're gonna pull everyone out one by one. Love you so much, Jaren. Everyone say goodbye, Funk Mod. 
Shout out Funk Mod. Really. He's awesome. Yeah. Bye. Alrighty. Up next we have Alchemy. Um, I would probably send you guys to my YouTube channel first because I think that's where you guys can look for more resources. So YouTube slash Alchemy. I do tutorials and I have an awesome podcast with DMCR who shows us some really amazing halftime essential stuff on there. I plan on having Musar on my own podcast pretty soon in the future. Uh, sorry not to put you on blast like that, but um, just because I want to have you on there. And um, for you guys, if uh, I would also like to say, like, I'm really big on the whole podcast thing and getting us talking and uh, making sure that all of you producers who stream and stuff have a voice as well. So um, I would probably be interested in having you guys on there too. And um, other than that, as far as like my music stuff, uh, I'll let you know when I finish music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks guys. Uh, Musar, thank you so much for having me. It was had a great time and um, I'll see you guys around. All right, love you, buddy. Take care. All right, bye. Care. Okay. All righty. Last but not least, the man, the myth, the blurry as fuck legend. <laughs> DMTR. Wait, this side. There we go. Shot yourself um, out. So you can find me anywhere um, just by DMTR Beats. Um, uh, my plans for the future are, first of all, there's a collab coming. Um, more free downloads, probably two more free downloads. My experimental EP is coming. Um, then more collabs and a remix. And then will be done for the year i think um so yeah lots of new music coming i'm gonna try to keep streaming most of the production um yeah and thank you for having me um had a great time so thank you so uh, much Dimitri. love you buddy i will see you later i want to say goodbye dmtr bye okie dokie all righty then thank you all so much for hanging out with me today this was fun let's do it again sometime soon thank you again so much to DMTR, to Alchemy, and to Funk Mod for doing this podcast with me. I really appreciate it. Um, I will be arranging the next series of podcasts very soon. Thank you so much to everyone who is following right now. Wavecore, Durandal, Sierra and O'Brien. Thank you to everyone who followed today. Thank you again to uh, Moshua and Amdago for those uh, subscriptions. Thank you all so much. Um, tomorrow we will have Freebie Friday. Uh, feedback, challenges, memes, bunch of fun stuff. Uh, next week, uh, Tuesday will be the sound design request stream. If you have any sounds that you want someone that you want me to try and remake, uh, either your own sounds, which maybe not, but like sounds from like songs or movies or TV shows that you want me to make, that'd be great. Uh, Theory Thursday next week, uh, full stream next week for Theory Thursday. No podcast next week. I will keep you all updated on that. Please be sure to. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the bell thingy or whatever. There's like a bell now, right? Um, and uh, tell YouTube to maybe give me like an actual username or something. And this is going to be where I cut the video on YouTube. Everyone say goodbye to YouTube. Bye. Okay. We're done. We're done. We're done for the day. We're done for the day. My brain is a bit mush, but that's okay. I probably shouldn't have smoked that joint at the very end of the stream, but that's okay. Uh, we're going to go find someone to raid. Uh, this was super fun. This was super, super fun. Thank you all so much for hanging out with me. This was a blast. Um, let's see. Do we want to raid up or raid down? Because we could raid. Who could we raid? We could raid Quicks. We could raid Quicks. Uh, we could raid Berserker. We could raid Bad Producer. What do we want to do? What are we thinking? I kind of want to raid Quicks because I kind of want to like we were talking about, I kind of want to get all those big streamers uh, or all those big producers to say, hey, there's smaller producers here. This is what you're supposed to be doing. So I feel like it might be a smart move to start rating some of these bigger streamers. Um, so let's go hang out at Quix's stream. Um, <clears throat> I will see you all tomorrow. Um, please be sure to type in Quix's chat, Musar Mafia, 808 Mafia is here to quarantine your base. Please do us all a favor and tell 
these bigger producers and DJs that, hey, you should be rating some of these smaller music streamers. Um, I think that is about it for me. So I'm going to go ahead and raid Quicks. I love you all so much. Take care of yourself. Be safe. Be happy. Take care of each other. Um, try and stay safe in this trying time we're in. And I will see you all tomorrow. Love you.